Hey there. Welcome to Relaxing Rain and True Scary Stories. I hope you're ready to be relaxed and creeped out at the same time. Before we begin, remember that there are only four ads in this entire video, after the first four stories. The rest of the video will be interruption free. If you like this video, subscribe to the channel and press that thumbs up for me. Lastly, thank you for being here. I know you have a lot of other choices. I hope you enjoy. Now, let's begin. I have only experienced sleep paralysis once in my life, but it was a terrifying ordeal. I am a female and I have a female twin sister, and we were about 14 or 15 years old when this situation occurred. In our childhood home, our room was a converted garage, very spacious, with built-in bed frames across from one another, a large window placed between them. To the side of my bed was another window with a street light that would pour light into the room while we slept. We have always been open to paranormal activity and have had numerous experiences in the house before, but nothing like this encounter. Late one night, I woke up to a dark, quiet room. I recognized that I was awake and fully conscious, but soon realized I could not move my legs or my arms at all. Just my eyes. I have never experienced this sensation before, so I was taken aback, but quickly decided to start small by trying to make my pinky finger move. I concentrated very hard for what seemed like 10 to 15 minutes on simply moving one finger when finally I began wiggling it slightly. Caught up in the excitement of this small accomplishment, I suddenly became acutely aware of an intense feeling that someone else was in the room watching this progress. Because I share a room with my sister, the first thing I did was look over towards her bed to the south of my field of vision and was surprised to see a dark figure standing by the head of her bed. My sister has long, fluffy and curly hair and at first I thought the silhouette of this shadow had hair like hers, so I initially thought that it was her. That was until the figure started drifting towards my bed. Keep in mind, I am still completely unable to move anything other than my eyes. As the figure moves closer to me, I realize it's not my sister and has no defining features, just a dark shadow. Additionally, it isn't walking, but more like floating towards me. My heart begins to beat rapidly and I start pumping adrenaline into my system, desperately trying to move as I see the figure floating closer and closer to me. The shadow never turns, but instead keeps what I assume to be its face pointed forward towards the window to the side of my bed with the street light coming in. It's staying at just the edge of my field of vision to where I must strain my eyes to keep looking at it. As the figure begins to enter the light, I am still unable to distinguish any defining features, despite it being illuminated by the light from the outside. This is when the figure begins to slowly turn its face upward towards the light, and I am still unable to distinguish any discernible features. I am almost at my breaking point mentally, as I am fighting to keep my eyes on this terrifying sight. I try shouting out to get my sister's attention, but I can't even get a whimper out. Suddenly, as if from a horror film, the figure's head begins to jerk and shake rapidly without an obvious cause or purpose. At this point, the whole situation was too much for me, and I force myself to faint, and I pass out again. When I woke up, I could move just fine, and was left with no evidence of this horrific encounter, aside from the terrifying memory. I believe I as well as others on the property, encountered the shadow figure again, but nothing quite as intimate as this time.
I have worked as a child psychiatrist for more than 10 years, but there is one incident that I will never forget. At the start of my career, I did not have a separate office, so I used to go to my clients' houses for counseling sessions. There was a child named Annie. Her parents told me that despite being 10 years old, she was unable to distinguish reality from her imagination. I used to have one-hour sessions with her, and it was exceedingly difficult to get her to open up to me. We played games and even watched movies to unveil her emotions, but she would not share what was going on inside her head. One day, as I was asking about her friends, she blatantly told me about a clown that stays in her basement. I found it funny but kept myself quiet because Annie was finally opening up to me. I asked her how she knew about the clown. Then she told me, there's a clown that comes to my bedroom every night. He tries to take me to the basement where he lives. He is not a good man. I knew that children around that age are quite imaginative, and sometimes they fail to understand the difference between reality and imagination. So I asked Annie to keep track of her dreams and gave her a small diary. After a few days, the topic of the clown subsided. Then, the following week, Annie came back with the diary and said, The clown was asking about you last night. He said he wants to meet you. I felt a little scared when she said that, not going to lie, but I quickly brushed it off, thinking she was just a child. As I opened the diary, I found nothing but dreams about the clown written on every page. I felt quite frustrated and decided to explore the basement. Annie told me that the clown does not like to be visited during the day. He gets angry, Annie remarked. I assured her that nothing was going to happen and went to the basement with her. I reached my hand for the light switch, but I couldn't find it. Finally, I found it. Just as I turned on the light, I saw a man-sized clown standing in the corner of the room. He stood there like a statue in his white pajamas, bright red bow tie, and a long white hat. The distinctive clown paint was running from the clown's eyes, making him look deformed, with an evil grin on his face. Slowly, he began to give a very wide smile and moved his eyeballs towards Annie and me consecutively. I shut my eyes and screamed as loudly as I could. When I opened my eyes, the clown had disappeared. As Annie and I began running upstairs, I could hear someone right behind me. Annie managed to get out, but the clown grabbed my leg. He came close to my face. I quickly realized it was Annie's dad. He looked furious and whispered, if you tell this to anyone, I will not spare you. This is a long story, and it's kind of hard to understand, but these are hands down the scariest moments of my life. For some context, we live in the suburbs, surrounded by houses, malls, and little shops. However, there is a 10 mile long trail that cuts through the deep woods near the downport entrance. About two miles into the trail, there is an abandoned factory. My friends and I used to go down to the factory at night to explore it. We are all big guys as we play football together. I'm 6'4 and 260 pounds, the biggest guy there, and the smallest is probably Thomas, who is shorter but still ripped. So we were never really scared and would often go in a group of at least four, about four times a week. We knew the layout of the area well, and nothing bad ever happened when I went with them. We had to walk the two mile trail in complete darkness, which was honestly worse than the factory itself until strange things started happening. There is a heavy MS-13 gang presence in the downport area, 
So that was the only thing that we were really scared of. All right, enough exposition. Let's get on with the story. The first time we went, it was me, Chuck, Thomas, and Dylan. We were just exploring because it had been months since our last visit. The place was covered in debris and graffiti, looking really scary in the pitch black darkness. We were surrounded by miles of woods with no houses in sight. The woods emitted a constant ambient noise of bugs, deer branches, and leaves rustling, so it was never truly quiet. Anyway, the first time we went, nothing really happened, but it was starting to feel uneasy. There are two main buildings, and the one farther back is much bigger than the one in the front. Half of the walls are knocked down, making it even scarier as you can see the woods from every angle. We were on the right side of the bigger building, and we never went to the left side, because it looked kind of boring and barren. We were being reckless, throwing rocks on the roof and making loud noises, but we left because nothing happened. That was the first time. The second time, everyone except Dylan was there. Roman joined us this time. It turned out to be the worst night for Roman and me. We started exploring the smaller building closer to the entrance, trying to find a way to get to the roof, when we heard an absolutely gut-wrenching scream coming from the back left building. We all froze and looked at each other like, what was that? We didn't hear any other noises except for that scream, which sounded like someone had just been killed. It was so horrifying. However, we did see other people with flashlights on the trail, so we thought it was just them being idiots. We kept looking around, and eventually, we made it to the bigger building. We entered the pitch black factory, where the only sounds were coming from the forest, and a trickling of water due to the rain the night before. The inside of the factory was covered in darkness, we went through one of the huge pride open metal garage doors and started exploring. Thomas and I were the ones with our phones out, using the flashlights to scan the area since we were still on alert because of the scream. As we walked toward the left side of the factory, we each scanned one side of the doorway, like in Rainbow Six Siege. I saw an old, dirty wooden wheelchair and nothing else while Thomas saw nothing but a big wall separating two sides of the huge room. We both shone our lights in the middle where there was a shopping cart, brand new looking cans of Red Bull, and a pallet with a bunch of blankets scrunched up into a small ball. Immediately we were like, what the heck? And stopped. We were so loud and there was no way there could be a person right there but we shone our lights at it. We were about 20 yards away, and we all agreed that it could not be a person because it was way too small. So we inched towards it, with Roman and me in the front. We were about 10 yards away when we stopped again. Everyone was silent, and I swear every single noise in the area stopped. There was no more sound of trickling water or ambient noise from the woods. We all stared at the blankets, and then they moved. The person underneath lifted his leg up and sat up, and we were gone. We ran away so fast that I didn't even turn around to see what was chasing us. We made it back to the trail and jogged all the way back to the car without saying a word, just thinking, what the heck, and oh my god. The next time we went, Bayer, Chuck, Roman, and Mikey joined us. This is a short story, but still, honestly, bad. We were walking the trail to the factory again, and reached the pitch black factory. As we entered the first building, where nothing had ever happened before, we saw a truck parked inside the factory. We all ran away because we thought it was either security, cops, or MS-13. We stayed by the fence for about 10 minutes to see if we heard anyone, but we didn't. 
Mikey and I then walked into the factory to inspect the truck. The license plates were scratched out, with duct tape covering them. The keys were in the ignition, and there was a wheelbarrow, garbage bags, and shovels in the bed of the truck. We heard more yelling coming from where we had seen the guy sleeping, so we got out of there, thinking that this was definitely gang-related. This is the last time we went, and probably the last time we will ever go. We went in the evening, so we still had some visibility, and it wasn't as scary. However, we quickly realized that we had made a mistake, because it became dark as soon as we reached the trail, and it was pitch dark when we got to the factory. We wanted to go see the car again, but it was gone. There was no tire marks or any evidence of it ever being there. It had simply vanished. We decided to keep looking around because we had never seen the factory in daylight, although the daylight was close to gone anyway. We were in the first building when we heard a full-on argument, a screaming match coming from the area where we had seen the guy sleeping. We walked over there slowly, and we were about 30 yards away from the entrance to the left side of the factory, when, out of the complete darkness, a short, skinny old man with long white hair and a long white beard rolled out on his wooden wheelchair. He was covered in blood and wearing a white t-shirt with a bloody stump where his right leg should have been. This guy looked absolutely deranged, and he started talking to us. Roman talked back to him. The guy noticed our phones and pleaded for us to help him, saying that his friend had fallen and needed our assistance. He wanted to use our phone. He started rolling towards us and Roman told him to back up. Roman and I were the only ones talking to him, while Chuck and Dylan were already inching away. The guy kept repeating the same thing over and over again when his friend walked out of the darkness. It was a medium-built guy holding a bottle upside down by the neck like a weapon. It was obvious that he was completely out of his mind. He didn't even look at us and just stared at the floor. He was standing behind the wheelchair guy who was whispering to him. Roman and I started backing away, but the wheelchair guy, who had been acting nice all this time, suddenly flipped a switch and started screaming at us. Come here, I'm gonna kill you. He began rolling towards us, and Roman and I started taunting him, telling him to walk over and do something while we ran away. Out of the corner of my eye, when I turned around, I saw the other guy running on all fours, screaming like a monster, with the broken sharp bottle in his hand like a knife. We got out of there. I jumped over the fence like an Olympian. They kept screaming at us until we were out of sight. Keep in mind that it was already dark again by this time. We are never going there again. The cool graffiti just is not worth it. I am not very good at writing. In fact, I feel like sometimes I ramble off topic, but I will give it my best to keep this in order. This is one of my many terrifying stories that will forever haunt me. For a little context, this happened when I was very young, around seven or eight years old. We lived in quite a big neighborhood. At the time, it was just my parents, my brother, who was three years older, and myself. My mom later had two other children. It was probably late spring leading into summer. Nights got longer and warmer, so my mom liked to keep the windows open. That being said, the sliding back door was connected to our kitchen. Our living room is what you come into first when you open the front door. We were sitting in the living room one night with my mom watching one of her favorite shows. We were all enjoying spending time with each other. 
Our dad worked nights, so he was not here during this. I remember my mom sitting on the corner of our sectional couch, my brother on the armchair next to her, and me right beside her. She always had to have ice-cold Pepsi with her at all times, and as kids, we always want what our parents have. So of course I asked her for a drink. She didn't want me to have too much before bed, so she told me to go get a small cup and she would give me just a little bit. I remember skipping into the kitchen excited, since she said I could have some, and reaching up to open the cabinet to grab a cup. In the moment, I realized I was too short to reach, but at the same moment, something sent a chill down my spine as I heard glass shatter. Confused, I wasn't quite sure where it came from, so I spun around to look. There, outside the back patio, was a broken beer bottle. I went back into the living room to tell my mom what I had heard and seen. It was the 90s, so parents at the time, we all know, didn't really care or worry as much as they do now. She brushed it off as some fluke, or you're just hearing things, ordeal. In the moment, I believed her. Of course I did, she's my mom. So I went back the second time to get the cup. I was on a mission. I can get that cup by myself. I didn't need help. So I scurried over to the counter and hiked my knee up on top to give me a boost. As I'm kneeling on the counter, ready to grab the cup, there it was. A weird breathing sound coming from the back porch. I turned my head slowly to look. As I jumped down off the counter, I still couldn't see much as it was dark outside. I started walking closer to the back patio to get a better look due to our back porch light being on. And right when I got to the sliding screen, a man stepped right in front of me. I remember feeling a deep burn in the pit of my stomach and static on my skin. Not only was this man standing there looking down at me, he was only wearing a shirt, a half-cut gray shirt. That's it. Nothing below. Just the shirt, which would appear to be wet. What was maybe not even a minute long felt like 20 minutes. He went to reach for the screen door latch. Thankfully, I was able to unfreeze from the horror and run back to my mom screaming. By the time she got there, he was gone, disappeared into the pitch dark of the night. The next morning I woke up and met up with my friends. We were on the backside of all the townhomes playing when it hit me, looking at the majority of everyone's back porch, there was a broken beer bottle. This man seemingly was peeping into everyone's back door I'm guessing to finally come across one that was open. Later it dawned on me who this man might have been. The maintenance man of the townhomes and his daughters went to my school. He always gave me the creeps and I just had this feeling that it was him. I don't know what would have happened if I never unfroze in that moment as he reached for the latch. If he had opened the door would he have grabbed me? Would he have hurt me? Would he have tried to come inside and hurt my mom? Would he have tried to come inside and hurt all of us? I'll never know, thankfully. No one knows. Nothing was ever done. Nothing was ever reported. I'm not even sure if my mom believes me. That maybe I was just exaggerating him being naked. But I know what I saw. It will forever be burned into my memory. I am a middle-aged adult now, and I live in Knoxville, Tennessee. 
At the time of this story, I was in my freshman year attending the University of Tennessee. The Smoky Mountains are about an hour from the campus. My friend group and I often traveled up there to hike and chill in general. One day, we decided to skip school to go hiking because it was over 90 degrees in the valley. We did inform our parents of our plan and that we would be back no later than noon the next day. Of course, this is the days before mobile cell phones. We traveled nearly two hours in order to get to our spot, quote unquote. Of course, being young kids at the time, we got whatever alcoholic drinks that we could scrounge up and didn't want to get caught with them. There were four of us, and we felt pretty comfortable on our own in this situation. My friend suggested that we go farther to escape the heat and avoid getting caught underage drinking. As we traveled another 30 minutes or so, the check engine light came on in my friend's car. He shot me a panicked look. My other two friends were too busy drinking to realize what was happening. We quickly turned around and headed back the way we came. Within 10 minutes, the car was smoking and we had to pull over. The engine was smoking and we had no service. We quickly sobered up and my friend, who I'll refer to as Shane, said that he had forgotten to get gas in his piece of crap Honda Civic that had a broken gas gauge. It was a nightmare scenario. Not a soul within sight, especially because it was a Tuesday morning in September. We figured in the worst case scenario, our parents would send some police up here to look for us the next day when they hadn't heard from any of us. Luckily, we had overpacked food and drinks for a couple days. We decided to put the car in neutral as it was on a downward slope and have Shane sit in it to push the brake when needed. One of my other friends got in with him, so me and my friend, who I'll refer to as Jared, pushed the vehicle to get it out of the slight ditch that it was in. We figured that if we got closer to the way we came, it would be easier for us to be found. As they descended the slope, Shane could not see fully around the bend, so the farther he went, the more he could see. Me and my other friend are a bit behind Shane at this point, and he is nearly to the bottom of the slope. All of a sudden, we hear the sound of gravel flying about and brakes screeching to a halt. We hear the sound of his horn honking out of control. Then we hear some odd gibberish type sounds coming from their vicinity. We are super concerned and startled. Shane yells, What is that thing, man? And my other friend yells something of the same effect. We approached the vehicle and saw some movement in the tree line, but couldn't make out anything. Shane then says, Get in the car! I just saw five midgets eating a deer's carcass. We both erupted in laughter and figured he was joking and just saw a deer. He remains stale in his expression, and the two of us look at each other and then the other friend who was in the car with him. I'll refer to the friend in the car as Rob. Rob is usually a laid-back guy, but when we looked at him, he was white as a ghost and looked to have sweat dripping down his forehead. Jared then looks at me and says, I think they're serious. I tried not to let the thought of something so insane scare me, but I looked over to where Shane was pointing and saw something out of a nightmare. There was blood all over the green foliage and what looked to be a deer's eyeball, among other disgusting body parts, strewn about the leaves. The worst part was the eyeball was half eaten. At this point, we are all freaking out, so Shane hops back in, and the three of us push his crappy car as far as we could muster along the fairly flat grade road. We are exhausted and must have gone over a mile pushing that car. We now approached an upward slope in the road and knew that we didn't have the might to push it up there without potential injury. We devised a game plan that we would stay for the night in hopes of someone helpful coming across the path of our broken down vehicle. The catch was we wanted to sleep in the surrounding foliage area to avoid detection from potentially dangerous people or things.
that could also come across our dire situation and see us as prey. So there we sat, not wanting to make a fire or give away our location to the potential threats that we had seen earlier. The dark truth that none of us wanted to face was the fact that we could have easily been followed that far, considering how slow we were going. We sat there in the dark, with flashlights in one hand and beef jerky in the other, not speaking much aside from the occasional, what was that sound? Me and Shane were tasked with staying up the first shift until around 3 a.m., then Rob and Jared would take over. Shane had brought a weapon with him for us to shoot for fun originally, but now it was our only form of defense. Around 1 a.m., we heard the dreaded sound of gibberish, eerily similar to what we had heard earlier. Me and Shane looked at each other, both scared out of our minds. Shane pulled out his weapon and awoke our other two friends. The gibberish woke them up very quickly. The odd thing about it was it sounded like it was coming from above us. We soon realized that it was approaching our direction and we had heard it directly above us along with a snapping branch. That's when we realized that it was in the tree that we used as shelter. We all sat there stiff as a board. Suddenly we heard three distinct loud thuds and subsequent sounds of gravel footprints. We watched the direction of the vehicle. Suddenly we hear the terrifying sound of a shattered window and Shane's car alarm going off. We see the lights come on in his car and that's when we see something that we will never unsee. We were originally confused because we could not see anyone. But then, we saw it. A person that must have been less than two feet tall. It was the most unsettling thing I have ever seen. It had a beard, big ears, long mangy hair, disproportionately large feet, and worst of all, it wielded what appeared to be a very large knife. Suddenly, we hear the sound of gibberish again and spot more of them, about five in total. One had what looked like a deer horn in its hand. They all looked alike and of the same stature. We then heard what sounded like a horn being blown and some very loud, inaudible gibberish. They scrambled back in our direction. At this point, we were all lying in the prone position behind a hump in the ground, covered by the foliage as much as possible. We heard them start to climb up into the tree, and then suddenly stop. Shane peeked up and then dropped just as fast as he had stood. I heard a gibberish sound again, this time so loud my eardrums hurt. There we were lying down, trying to remain hidden, and we saw one of these creatures standing there, flaring its nostrils, as though smelling for us. It drops down on its knees and touches Rob. Rob then says, Please, just leave us alone. It must have stood there forever, staring at him, before we heard the sound of gibberish coming from the tree above. It then proceeds to get up and climb the tree. We all sat there without moving or speaking until the early morning. Finally, we hear the sound of a diesel truck engine approaching and an elderly couple gets out to inspect our car. We run out of our hiding spot and tell them what must have been the most confusing story of all time. He didn't seem to believe us, but said that he would get us some gas and some help. Finally, he comes back after what felt like an eternity with a full gas can and ensures that my friend's Honda Civic will start. He then says, Make sure you know what mushrooms you're eating next time. When we finally got home, our parents were worried, since it was nearly 5 p.m. We didn't tell them of our overnight terrors, and just said that we had lost track of time. I have always been very close to my grandfather, who is Cherokee Indian. He is the only person I have told this story to. He claims to have had a similar experience with these people before. He told me of the legend 
of the Yunwi Sunzi, the Cherokee legend of the little people who roam the woods. They are apparently known to antagonize people throughout the years. He added that they are mostly a positive force, but do major harm to those who disrespect them and their territory. He jokingly said, You can thank your heritage that you're still alive, but part of me thinks that there is some truth to that statement. In the vast labyrinth of unsolved true crime cases, few have captured the public's imagination quite like the perplexing vanishing of Dr. Sneha Ann Philip. A brilliant and ambitious young physician, Dr. Philip's life came to an inexplicable halt on September 10, 2001, right before the tumultuous chaos of the 9-11 terrorist attacks in New York City. Her sudden disappearance, overshadowed by the devastating events of that fateful day, left law enforcement, friends, and family grappling with the question, what happened to Sneha Ann Philip? Dr. Sneha Ann Philip was born on October 7, 1969, in India, and from an early age, it was evident that she possessed an unwavering determination to succeed. She ventured to the United States to pursue her dream of becoming a medical professional, eventually graduating with honors from the Chicago College of Osteopathic Medicine in 1995. With her aspirations firmly rooted, she moved to the vibrant metropolis of New York City, where she completed her residency at the prestigious Cabrini Medical Center in Manhattan. On the morning of September 10, 2001, the world had no inkling of the darkness that was about to envelop it, nor did anyone anticipate the inexplicable fate that awaited Dr. Sneha Ann Philip. She was seen leaving her Battery Park City apartment that morning, her energy and optimism a reflection of the city's bustling atmosphere. Like countless other New Yorkers, she was heading to work, preparing to fulfill her duties as a physician at the Cabrini Medical Center. Surveillance cameras captured footage of Dr. Philip at a local grocery store near her apartment that day, making a routine purchase providing the last glimpse of her before she vanished into thin air. However, as night descended upon the city, she failed to return home, setting into motion a series of events that would unravel an enigmatic puzzle. In the wake of the devastating 9-11 attacks, the search of Dr. Sneha Ann Philip was inevitably overshadowed by the urgency of finding survivors and victims at Ground Zero. Amidst the rubble and destruction, the hunt for the missing physician was hampered, with her case receiving only fragmented attention. As the dust settled and the enormity of the tragedy sank in, investigators turned their focus to uncovering the truth behind Dr. Phillips' disappearance. Early on, they considered the grim possibility that she had been tragically killed in the terrorist attacks. Her apartment's proximity to Ground Zero fueled this hypothesis but it was soon challenged by emerging evidence. Piecing together fragments of her life, investigators unearthed a hidden side of Dr. Philip that few knew about. They discovered that she had struggled with alcohol-related issues, and her past included a brush with law for shoplifting at the very grocery store that she was seen visiting on the day she vanished. This line of inquiry suggested that she might have wandered into obscurity intentionally disappearing to escape her problems. However, just as investigators seemed to be settling on this theory, eyewitnesses began to emerge, offering possible sightings of Sneha and Philip after September 10, 2001. One individual claimed to have seen her in a Manhattan hospital on September 11, 2001, while others testified to spotting her in different parts of the city in the days immediately following the attacks. These accounts injected fresh uncertainty into the case and reignited hope that she might still be alive. As the investigation progressed, it became increasingly apparent 
that the circumstances surrounding Dr. Phillips' disappearance were far from straightforward. The trail grew colder with each passing day, leaving investigators with more questions than answers. The inexplicable disappearance of Dr. Sneha and Philip opened the floodgates of speculation and gave rise to a myriad of theories. One prevailing theory was that she met with a tragic end on September 11th, and her remains were obliterated amidst the rubble of the collapsing World Trade Center towers. This idea, while tragic, offered a measure of closure to some, though it failed to explain the alleged sightings of her in the days that followed. Conversely, the theory of a voluntary disappearance gained traction as investigators uncovered the complexities of Dr. Phillips' personal struggles. Some postulated that the stress of her past legal troubles and potential relapse may have culminated in her deciding to reinvent herself in a new life, far removed from the constraints of her previous existence. But even this theory left many unanswered questions, especially regarding the alleged sightings and the absence of any communication from the missing doctor. As time passed, darker theories emerged, suggesting that Dr. Philip might have fallen victim to human trafficking or abduction, explaining the lack of contact with her family and friends. These conjectures, while terrifying, lacked concrete evidence and only added to the complexity of the case. The disappearance of Dr. Sneha and Philip remains an enigma wrapped in a puzzle, concealed by the shroud of time and tragedy. As the years drift by, hope to finding her alive diminishes, but the embers of determination to solve the case still flicker within the hearts of her family and friends. The mystery of Dr. Philip's disappearance serves as a haunting reminder of the frailty of human existence and the profound impact a single individual can have on the lives they leave behind. Until new evidence comes to light, the fate of Dr. Sneha and Philip will continue to remain an indelible stain on the canvas of true crime history, an enduring enigma that defies resolution. I recently had an experience that many will not believe. Honestly, I'm not sure I actually do myself. My upbringing wasn't especially religious per se. We never attended church, but I'm sure if you asked my parents if we were a Christian family, they would say yes. It wasn't something I ever discussed with them, but I would be willing to wager their view was similar to mine. My feeling is that a person's connection to the spiritual is personal and individual, and I would guess my view on the supernatural would be the same. I would assume that you would have to believe in some form of afterlife to believe in ghosts or spirits. I'm not exactly positive of my view towards them, but I know what I just saw has made me question their existence in our world and how and why they may share it with us. The end of last week, I went for a run on a paved trail that surrounds a local neighborhood. I believe at one point the trail was part of a park in that area, but from what I've been told, the city closed the park due to low attendance. I guess the trail continued to be maintained by the city for the use of residents of the neighborhood, but it proved to be a popular attraction for everyone because it was lit all night. This feature made it a somewhat safer place for use after dark. I, myself, had run on it several nights that I was unable to sleep. The morning this happened, it was about 4.30, and I had decided to knock out a few miles before dawn. Since it was the heart of summer, it would be sweltering by 9 a.m., and I have never ran well in the severe heat. Since it's less than a mile away from my house, I usually walk the track. Doing this also gives me an opportunity to warm up before I reach it. I made it there around 4.15, and after a few minutes of stretches, set my watch timer at exactly 4.20. My custom is to start off slow, so I completed my first mile in roughly nine or so minutes. As I began the second, I noticed a fellow jogger some 60 yards ahead running toward me. 
This wasn't especially odd on this trail. People are free to run either direction, and they often do. Once the jogger got close, I could tell that it was a man, thin and of average height. I gradually began to increase my pace and was soon about to pass him. As I did so, I offered a friendly wave and hello, but rather than say hi and wave back, he continued on and appeared to ignore me. My initial reaction was to get huffy and mumble, rude, under my breath. He had to have seen and heard me. It was a quiet morning with no one around, and we were under a very bright overhead street lamp. Rather than slow down, I continued to increase my pace to my usual one, and quickly glanced back at the man. I'm not sure why I did, but something in the back of my mind told me to do it. So I did. When I glanced back, he was gone. This caught me by such surprise, I stopped in mid-stride and stared at where he should have been. I have never been so befuddled in my life. There was nowhere he could have gone. We both should have been directly within the light of the lamp, and walls surrounded the back of the homes. There was only two or three feet of grass between the wall and the edge of the track, and even that area was well illuminated. This was about the time my confusion began to be replaced by fear, and other questions started creeping in. Did I just say hi and wave at a ghost? Did I even believe in them in the first place? Goosebumps covered my body, and I started to shiver. I wondered then if perhaps this was all a joke, and my confidence started to rise again. I called out and asked if he was still there and chuckled. All right, you can come out now. Despite the attempt at bravado, I knew this was not a prank. The little confidence I had regained in that moment quickly fizzled away, and I was left alone, trembling in fear once more. This was about the time my brain told me to run away, and I listened. I booked it out of there, going the opposite direction he was, of course, and didn't stop until I made it back home. By the time I made it home, my husband was getting up for work. Although I considered telling him what had just happened, I didn't. I assumed he wouldn't believe me or he would just laugh at me. He isn't a mean or uncaring husband, but considering that we spend a considerable amount of our time joking around or pranking each other, I thought he would think I was tricking him. Now you know why I thought someone may have been pranking me. Unfortunately, in this case, no one was laughing. Now, I wait until the sun rises before I go running. Hot or not, I never want to run into that guy again. I did return to the park track again a few days later, but with my 15-year-old daughter in tow. The entire time I was there, I was constantly looking around. My daughter asked me if I was having a seizure. Even though it was funny, I couldn't laugh because I had my mind on that man. I still haven't told anyone else what I saw. You guys are the only people who know, and I imagine you all don't believe me either. Even so, to those of you who have had similar experiences in your life, never forget, even if no one else believes you, there will always be at least one person who does. I went to a renaissance fair for the first time in my life in 2017, at age 28. I was super excited to finally go, and had a few items I was going to look for. The day of the fair was very fun, picking up beers to carry around to different booths, and browsing things that can't be bought in any regular store. It was not too hot, and I found a great kilt that I purchased. But something happened that day that turned the next two days into some of the worst of my life. By the time I went to bed that night, my head was swimming, and my vision was mercurial, but that can easily be explained by heat, alcohol, and exhaustion. The day after the fair was a Monday, 
and I had to be at my still new job before 8 a.m. in downtown Dallas. Driving to work is when I started to feel that something was terribly wrong with me. I noticed this first by my reaction to music. If I started listening to a song, I had to finish it, even if I didn't like it. The voices of the classic rock songs I know by heart had shifted up or down a half a step in timber. I also was starting to literally see the music laid out on the freeway in front of me. By the time I got to work, I was pretty freaked out. I felt like I had taken a hallucinogenic drug, but the thing was, I didn't take anything. I don't like the idea of taking anything, because if anyone was going to have a bad trip, I knew that my neurotic and macabre brain would make it happen. I also have severe catseridophobia. Mock me if you want, but everyone has a story behind their worst visceral fear. While I was sitting at my desk and talking to my boss, the chief operating officer, I saw dozens of Satans, quote unquote, or cockroaches, crawling around the walls and floors behind him. I also felt like I had to hold onto my desk to keep from falling over. My boss's voice was constantly changing decibels, and I was just trying to keep it together for dear life. Trying to work that day was hell. At one point, I had to go up to the wellness room in our office, meant for breastfeeding mothers, so I could lie on the floor in complete darkness and silence for an hour. While I drove home that evening, the bizarre reactions to music intensified. If the songs changed tempo suddenly, it freaked me out. If there were high and low notes rapid fire in the song, I could barely breathe. I will never be able to listen to The Devil Went Down to Georgia the same way again. That night, I tried to enjoy this unwelcome trip by something solo and NSFW with disastrous results. One of the most physically painful nights of my life. The next morning, I felt a little better, but was not back to normal. Because I took no drugs, I was legitimately worried that I was having a psychotic break. I have an anxiety disorder, and my mental health has struggled over the years. I ended up calling my psychiatrist's office to beg for an emergency phone session. While I described everything I had been experiencing, he listened patiently and said that I could have been slipped something at the fair, but also could be experiencing a psychotic break. When I got to the NSFW disaster, he was completely shocked by what happened and said there was no way my brain did that to itself. The conclusion was that someone slipped me a cocktail of very powerful hallucinogens into one of my beers. To add insult to injury, I learned that the most powerful drugs like that also get out of your system the fastest. For that reason, I still don't know what some cruel person gave to me for God only knows what reason. I held it together with my job and left with no lasting effects, except the confusion and curiosity that I still have six years later. In my early 20s, I used to deliver newspapers overnight twice a week, usually from around 12 to 6 a.m. It was one of the most enjoyable jobs I have ever had as an introvert, but being a young female traveling through the darkness and isolation of the late night made me a little paranoid. This led to some incidents that were terrifying in the moment, but quickly became a laughable memory. The first scary experience I had was after having been on the job for over a month. I had become comfortable with my route and was able to do it mostly by memory at this point. In this instance, I was approaching a historical Victorian home with a wraparound porch. The walkway up to the porch was long, dark, and surrounded by thick plant life, and it was always a little creepy. This night, 
I approached the porch as usual and tossed the paper toward the requested door. This door was at the end of a narrow, dark corridor, so I would stop at the beginning of the corridor and toss the paper as I have terrible night vision and didn't want to trip on something and make a big scene. I went through with my usual routine of tossing the paper from a distance, when suddenly a dark shape came flying at me from near the door. I screamed, turned on my heel, and ran to my car. Upon looking up as I opened my car door, I realized it was only a black cat, and I had probably frightened him just as much as he had frightened me. The second incident occurred not long after the first. My route was split in half between the edge of town and ritzy suburban neighborhoods and isolated farms that took me down long dirt roads, miles from civilization. One night I pulled up to a mailbox in front of an old farmhouse, right on the edge of a large field. I grabbed a paper from my back seat, and as I reached my arm out the window to place the paper in the box, I noticed the face of a creature right next to my arm, close enough that it could have easily moved forward a few feet and quickly made its way through my open window. I screamed as I struggled to process what I was seeing with my poor night vision, when I realized it was just a deer hanging out next to the paper box. I am not sure how I didn't spook him, but he was totally unbothered by either my presence or my scream. I laughed, hoped to God I didn't wake anyone, and finished out my night. The third and creepiest incident was the result of building paranoia over the course of months and occurred at the end of my time delivering papers. Since starting the route, I had noticed the same vehicle almost every night driving slowly through one of the nicest subdivisions on my route. Being a lone female at around 2 or 3 a.m., this was unnerving, but they were never close enough to think much of it. I kept my eyes on the vehicle with every visit, especially since I was there at varying times of night, but somehow always managed to see the same vehicle meandering through the neighborhood. One night in mid-fall, probably early October, I approached a home whose paper box required me to get out of the car and walk across the road to deliver their paper. I grabbed the paper, placed my hand on the door handle, and suddenly spotted something out of the corner of my eye. In the distance, about 30 yards from the mailbox, there was a figure standing extremely still. The figure was facing my car as if they were watching me and not moving a muscle. The figure was dressed in all dark colored clothing, except for a lighter colored shirt with stripes, which made some kind of reflective material akin to a construction vest. I immediately thought of the slow moving vehicle I always saw in this neighborhood. Nope. I locked my doors, took a deep breath, and took a second look. My brain could not come up with a good reason why someone would be standing so still in the middle of the yard at such a late hour, nor rationalize what I might be seeing. I was ready to completely abandon the entire neighborhood for the night and come back with someone else after sunrise to finish my deliveries. I decided to turn my brights on and take one last look to confirm that I was really seeing what I thought I was seeing. I flipped the switch, looked up, and found myself staring at a very well-made scarecrow. A scarecrow. It was then I realized that it was indeed October, and our town always had a scarecrow competition. I hope these homeowners won, because it was very well put together, and in the darkness, I absolutely could not tell the difference between the scarecrow and an actual human being. I moved on to a better job shortly after the third incident, but I was left with a lot of interesting stories from the short time on my route.
This happened years ago, when I was 19. I'm now in my mid-twenties. I still remember this very clearly because of how creeped out I was. Back then, I was living 600 plus miles away from my parents in a different state. Even though there was a distance, my mom and I still talked on the phone at least twice a week, and we were still really close. So when we found out her cancer was back, I didn't think twice about dropping everything to drive down to see her. A plane ticket would be too expensive, and I had a 10-year-old Toyota that might have been a bit beat up, but still got me from A to B cheaply and quietly. My parents weren't thrilled at the idea of me driving the 11 hours by myself, but my mind was made up. So they offered me a deal. I would stop at a rest stop every two to three hours and stretch my legs and call them. And in exchange for this courtesy, they would pay for my gas. If I did not call within the three hour window though, they would assume that I had been in an accident and would call me repeatedly interrupting the audiobook or podcast that they knew that I would have on. I accepted the deal, and that's why I was at this particular rest stop at 2.45 a.m. This was actually one of the nicer stops. Well-lit, multiple vending machines that did not have huge cages around them, the payphone was not broken, and it looked clean. There were a couple cars there with people sleeping in them, I still had 15 minutes before I had to check in with my parents. I got out of my car and stretched, and then almost jumped out of my skin when I heard a man's voice right behind me. Uh, miss, can I ask you for a favor? I turned around, and he's leaning against my car. I have no idea how he got there so fast. I didn't see him when I parked, but there he was uncomfortably close to me. He looked like he's in his 40s. He didn't look dirty or twitchy. He was too close, but his body language did not scream threatening. And even though I was 19 years old, barely over 5 feet, and at that point in my life, 110 pounds soaking wet. And even though I had already binged a lot of true crime media and knew the dangers of a girl my age alone at night, with an out-of-state license plate. My dumb self asked what he needed. He told me that he accidentally locked his keys and his phone in his truck and asked if he could borrow my phone real quick to call his friend. It will just take a second and it will really help him out. And I almost handed him my phone. I was reaching into my pocket to hand it to him with a Pollyanna, no problem, and then I actually looked at his face. Like I said, this rest stop was surprisingly well lit, and this guy looked really normal, except for his eyes. He had dead shark eyes. You know what I'm talking about. It's the Ted Bundy, Dick Cheney, actress in a Glade commercial who's trying to convince us that she's in love with some dumb guy who doesn't know how an air freshener works eyes. They're smiling, but the eyes are vacant and creepy and staring way too hard. I got that feeling, that runaway feeling. I knew immediately not to hand this guy my only way to call for help. So I put on my best customer service smile and told him, Oh, I'm sorry, but I don't have a charger and I need to save all my battery for the tracking app that my parents have on my phone. And I need the juice to call my parents which I actually have to do right now, but good luck. And I turned and walked about 20 feet away. And he does not leave. He was still just leaning against my car, watching me. And now I didn't know what to do. I didn't want to leave him alone with my car because he creeped me out and he had a serial killer face. So going to the bathroom is out, but I also wanted to get away from him prove that I'm not going to help, and maybe he'll leave. I could technically get into the car, but I would have to get really close to him, unless I crawled over my passenger side seat, and he's not moving. So I did the first thing that came to mind. I called my dad, and my dad, for the first time that night, did not pick up the phone. 
When I heard his voicemail, I glanced back. The guy still had not moved. He's standing still, staring at me. So I faked a phone conversation with my dad. I angled my body so that the guy couldn't see that I had hung up the phone and loudly said that I should be home in about 30 minutes, when in reality, I was still at least four hours away. I mentioned exactly where I was and reassured the fake caller that this was a good rest stop with plenty of lighting and a couple of visible security cameras. The guy still had not moved, and I am running out of steam on this fake conversation. In the years since, I've thought of a lot of things I could have said while pretending to talk to my dad, but in that moment, I was beginning to seriously freak out, and my mind went blank. So I hung up and did not know what to do. I had hoped the fake phone call would scare him off, but he was still leaning against my car. I stalled for another couple of minutes. I bought cookies from the vending machine. I walked around a little. At this point, he's been leaning against my car staring at me for at least 10 minutes. I honestly debated waking up one of the men sleeping in their parked cars and asking for help. And just the thought of having to wake someone up to help me get into my own car annoyed me enough that I stopped stalling and headed right back to my car. I decided that unless he touched me, I'm just going to pretend that he's not there. He waited until I was unlocking my car door before he started talking to me again. He told me again that he really needs to use my phone. He's stranded here unless he can call his friend to bring the spare keys. He's not angry or begging. His voice sounds weirdly friendly, but he had been creepily watching me for way too long while blocking my exit, so I'm not falling for it. I almost pointed out the working payphone, just in case I'm wrong about this, and I was being rude to a guy who needs help. But then he leaned forward as I was getting in, and I lost all nerve and slammed and locked the door as fast as possible. He didn't move until I started the car and put it in reverse, and then he finally stepped back and let me pull out. I didn't even have my seatbelt on. I was so focused on getting away from him. And then halfway out of the rest stop, my mom called me. My mom, who would freak out if I didn't pick up, and who was already sick. And I needed to put on my seatbelt. I could still see him in my mirror. He was standing right next to where I was parked with his back to me. He was far enough away that I felt okay parking again to answer the phone. But I kept my engine running, and I kept watching him. I don't want my mom to worry, so I told her everything is fine, where I am, my ETA, etc. Now that I was in my locked car away from him, I was beginning to feel like I had overreacted. She scolds me about speeding, and I tune her out, because the guy is moving now. As my mom lectures me about road safety, I watch the guy cross to a truck unlock the door and get in. The keys being locked in no longer seemed to be an issue for him. I watched the truck head back out to the freeway and drive out of sight. I had to pretend to be fine to not upset my mom. I didn't get back onto the road for another 20 minutes, and when I did, I did not speed. I did not want to see that truck. I found out years later that the closest city to that rest stop has a major problem with sex trafficking, and that girls who look like they don't live nearby, or maybe look like they are living out of their cars, tend to be targets. I don't know if that was what was happening, or if he was trying to just scare me into handing over my phone. In 2019, my husband and I were newly married with a one-year-old daughter. He had recently reconnected with his stepfather, 
and he invited us to a 4th of July fireworks show with his family in a larger city near us. We had a great time reconnecting and enjoying the show from a distance so as to not upset our one-year-old and allow her the experience of seeing fireworks for the first time. It was a lot of fun and a good memory as one of our first family outings. However, what happened afterward still haunts my husband and I to this day. After finally exiting the traffic from the fireworks show, we headed to the nearest gas station. My husband went inside to prepay with cash as the price was 10 cents cheaper that way and my daughter and I waited inside the car. I always try to be aware of my surroundings, especially in places that I'm not familiar with, but it was hard not to notice the man standing out front of the gas station. He was leaning against the brick wall, struggling to sit still, eyes darting back and forth among the various customers at the pumps. When he noticed me in the car basically alone, he immediately locked eyes with me and did not look away. His gaze was incredibly intense and made me very uncomfortable. Like all women, I'm used to the usual gas station creep who can't stop staring and might even make a weird remark or two. But there was something about this man's glare that was deeply unsettling. There was an emptiness behind his eyes and a primal element to his stare. I was very relieved when my husband returned to the car moments later. My relief did not last, however. The man became visibly agitated upon seeing my husband's return. His face became angry, and his gaze shifted quickly back and forth between myself and my husband. He began getting antsy again and started pacing back and forth, never taking his eyes off of us. My husband noticed this too, and began watching the man trying to figure out what his deal was. The man then made a beeline for our car, and my stomach dropped to my knees. Something was deeply wrong, and I was terrified of what was about to happen. As he made his way over, my husband told me to lock the doors, and I gladly obliged. As I learned from talking to my husband later, when the man approached him at the pump, he recounted some sob story about his girlfriend abandoning him there and asked for a ride home. My husband said that the entire time he was telling his story, he was staring at me in the car. While he already found this guy scary, he said he immediately understood the man's intentions and began trying to get him to leave. He told him that no, we were sorry, but we could not give him a ride. We needed to get our daughter home, and we weren't traveling anywhere near his direction. The man insisted, pleading his case with my husband. With each refusal, he got angrier and angrier, and while I couldn't hear the conversation inside the car, I noticed the change in his demeanor, and I was terrified he was going to get violent. After several refusals, my husband pulled out his phone and told the man that if he didn't leave us alone, he was going to call the cops. The man gritted his teeth, gave me an angry glare, and walked back to his previous post at the front of the gas station. My husband quickly returned the nozzle to the pump, closed the tank, and jumped back in the car. As we sped off, I took one last glance behind me, and the man was angrily watching us leave, as he puffed on a cigarette in front of the station. When he got back in the car, my husband was pretty shaken up. As we drove away, he told me what the man had said and how unnerving it was that he would not take his eyes off of me while he was talking to him. He said he was terrified the man was going to try to force his way into the car because of how insistent and angry he was becoming. He was surprised and relieved that the man actually walked away. Needless to say, this was one of the most unsettling experiences we have ever had, and I don't want to imagine what would have happened to my young family if this man hadn't given up when he did.
Let me first preface this by saying that terrible things don't just happen in the movies, but in fact, they do happen in everyday normal life. Most people are lucky enough to go through life without any major encounters. I had an experience that I would like to share to see what people think. Was I rational in my choices? Did I overreact? What would you have done? I think hearing responses will be therapeutic and perhaps help me get past the events of this story. Last year, I attended college at a major university on the southeastern coast of the United States. I loved it so much, mainly because I didn't have to deal with snow or the cold weather. I basically had hot or warm weather every day, which was a huge change from the climate I grew up in. On this particular spring break from school, I decided to go home and visit my parents back in Maine. I decided that I was going to try to drive the over 20-hour drive straight through, perhaps stopping for brief naps or food along the way. At first, this seemed like an awesome idea. I could get there relatively quickly and spend most of the time at home, rather than traveling. I spent most of the drive listening to music and catching up on some of my favorite podcasts, Unfortunately, the trip would take a terrible turn in Pennsylvania. I was driving through Pennsylvania shortly after midnight, and well, my eyes started to get a little heavy, and I was having a lot of trouble focusing on the road. And anybody who has driven through Pennsylvania knows that it's a hard drive even when you have complete focus. It's always foggy and very mountainous with many twists and turns. I decided that at the next rest area, I would pull over and at least rest my eyes for an hour or two, just to be safe. Well, I never made it to the rest area. I dozed off for a second, and I lost control of my small car, and went right off the side of the road through a guardrail and down to a small drop-off. Miraculously, I wasn't injured too badly, but my car was destroyed, and I was completely surrounded by trees not sure how to get back up and onto the highway. Of course, it was pitch black outside, and the trees consumed the entire area, blocking out most or pretty much all of any natural light. I tried to remain calm and ignore the terrible pain I was experiencing to try and call and get some help. One problem, I could not find my phone. It was in my cup holder, but after the crash, it was so dark, I couldn't find it anywhere, inside or outside of my car. I didn't think I was injured badly, as previously mentioned, but I wanted to use the flashlight on my phone to make sure I didn't have any major cuts or anything. I then decided my best course of action at this point would be to see if it was possible to climb back up the slight decline that my car had fallen off of. It seemed impossible in my condition, and with the limited visibility, it just wasn't a height I could reach at the moment, and truth be told, I was lucky that I was not injured further after my car dropped down this thing. Thankfully, the guardrail slowed my car down enough. Realizing that climbing, driving, or calling anybody was not an option, I began to yell and scream for help, but as you can imagine, it did nothing. There was no one around. I slouched to the side of my car and finally started to feel real emotion. I was scared and cold, and now the real fear finally started to make my eyes fill up with tears. I had no survival skills. What was I going to do until morning? Just sit in a ball in the fetal position? I decided that walking through the wooded area until I can find an area to climb where maybe there was a slight hill instead of the drop-off where my car was. Of course, now in hindsight, my best bet would have probably been to just stay put, because somebody in the morning would have noticed the accident and phoned it in. Maybe even someone passing by in the night and noticing the damage at the side of the road. As I grabbed some items from my car, I heard a noise. It sounded like the rustling of tree branches and footsteps wait. Footsteps. I hid on the other side of my car, paralyzed in fear. What kind of animals did they have in Pennsylvania? My first thought was a bear 
or something like that. Is that how it was going to end? Mauled by a bear? However, what actually presented itself in front of me was even more shocking. It was three men coming out of the trees. I couldn't make too much out, but all three of them had huge beards. Looked like their clothes were completely dirty and were carrying some kind of hunting rifles. I wasn't sure if I should yell for help or try to stay hidden from these men. For some crazy reason, my instincts were telling me to stay hidden, which seems like the exact opposite thing you should do in this situation. One of the men, who looked like the tallest of the three, yelled out in a raspy, rugged voice, Is anyone out there? They didn't have any flashlights or anything, so I decided to quietly sneak around to the other side of my car and make a run for it into the woods. As I slowly and very quietly made my way around the car, I was wrestling with the idea in my head that these people probably just wanted to help me, and I was probably putting myself in more danger by running into these woods. But the demeanor and possibility of getting shot was a chance that I did not want to take. I was about five feet cleared from the car when I started to sprint, and of course in no time at all. I brought noise and attention to myself. The same man as before caught a glimpse of me as I ran into the woods and screamed, Hey, get back here! I swear I heard the loud boom of a gunshot. I didn't hear it hit a tree or anything. I just remember hearing a loud boom. I don't know what else it could have been. I was terrified. I heard them following me from what seemed like several directions. I heard one of them yelling something about private property or restricted land or something of that nature. I just kept running and running for about an hour until I finally saw faint light shining through the trees. It was a road that looked like it led to a small town or at least a few stores with lights. I walked into the gas station, feeling and looking bloody, battered, and bruised. The worker inside looked baffled and disgusted. I told him to please call the police. The police showed up in no time, and my parents were notified. They were going to drive down and pick me up as soon as they could. The police insisted I go to the local hospital so my injuries could be assessed. When talking to the police, I told them everything about the three guys that came to the scene and chased me with weapons into the woods. The police said they would locate my car and take a look to see if they could find anything, or anyone. My car was empty. Everything had been stolen out of it. Even some of the interior car parts had been removed. Nothing else really came from this incident. I didn't have any major injuries, and my insurance took care of the car. I now live back home with my parents and attend school locally. I try not to drive at night if I don't have to. I guess I have a phobia or something now. I am thankful to be alive and well, but still have anxiety and terrible thoughts pertaining to that night. Approximately two years ago, I was working as an engineer for a relatively new company in my area. I hadn't been out of school very long, but I was excited that my degree at least seemed to be paying off so far. The company I worked for had a large local client base, and one of our new contracts was developing and designing a new set of exhibits for our local zoo. On paper, it seemed like a fairly simple job, but one that I found to be quite unique. Coming out of school, I didn't ever think I'd be working for, or at a zoo, on a job. I always envisioned larger, more commercial properties. For this job, we were going to have to work overnight, so that the construction didn't upset the animals during the day when the zoo was filled with guests. We worked for about two weeks or so with no issues. We did have to make a few adjustments to our original plans or design, but it wasn't anything the construction team couldn't handle. Every night around 3 a.m., we would head to a local diner for a lunch break and some needed food. 
but on this specific night, I decided to stay back and work on one of the more complex locking mechanisms for one of the newly constructed exhibits. I remember finishing up about 45 minutes later and noticed the crew had not arrived back yet. I started cleaning up my area when I suddenly heard a noise, almost sounding like someone bumping into a workstation, like a scrape against the floor. I just figured it was one of my crew finally getting back from their longer than normal break and continued picking up my tools and scrap supplies. No more than 30 seconds later, I started to hear more noises. This time it sounded like banging on the side of a door. Slightly annoyed, I made my way to the door to make sure it wasn't a staff member, or worse, someone who should not be on the property. I opened the door and saw nobody. Nothing was there. I made my way through the door over to the cafeteria, where chairs were out of place and several tables had been flipped over. At this point, I thought maybe a group of teenagers had snuck into the property, as it was well known to the public that our company was working overnight construction at the zoo. I yelled out and asked, Who's there? To no response. At this point, I began to get angry because any damage that occurred on my watch would be my responsibility, and I knew my team would be careful to not disrespect our client and leave a mess like this. As I proceeded through the cafeteria, I started to hear little shuffles coming from the kitchen area behind the counter. I was about 10 feet from the counter when my heart felt like it literally stopped beating in my chest. What I saw made me freeze in fear. It almost felt like I could not move, like I was stuck in a dream. Standing in front of me was four monkeys, or apes. From what I remember, I counted at least four, and they seemed to be exploring the kitchen area. My yelling must have alerted them, because one or two of them were staring at me. I tried to slowly and calmly make my way back toward the door. The animals weren't enormous, but they were a good size, and I had no idea if they were violent or docile. When I was just a couple feet from the door, the monkeys started howling and screaming like crazy. They were screeching and started banging on the walls. I turned and ran as fast as I could into the main office. To my horror, at least two of the apes had followed me and were now banging on the door that I had just shut behind myself. The sound of their cries and wailing was so unsettling, I actually was starting to fear for my safety. From the office, I called my coworkers and told them what happened, and to stay at a safe distance upon their return. And I also called zoo management, the authorities, so they could handle what seemed to be wild animals loose at the zoo. After only about 10 minutes, the proper authorities showed up to take care of the situation. At that point, the monkeys were no longer in my line of vision, so I'm not sure how they captured them and got them back to their exhibit. After an investigation into the matter, it turns out that some of the work that was being done at the zoo caused an electrical malfunction, which allowed a few doors to come open at some of the exhibits. Every time this story gets brought up, someone says that the lion exhibit was left open, and I am lucky it didn't escape and try to eat me alive. I also get made fun of because of my terror and reaction to the event made the staff think that I was being chased by 1,000-pound gorillas, when in reality, it was a much smaller species. As much as people like to joke about the situation, it was a truly horrifying experience. I know that this is not your typical scary story, but when you're staring at a wild animal and they are looking right back at you, it is completely rational to fear for your safety or even your life. I've been lurking here from time to time, just hearing about other people's experiences and possible explanations to satisfy my horror addiction. Books, games, movies, real-world unexplained phenomena. I consume everything. But the possibility that something paranormal might happen in my life never occurred to me. 
I still don't know what to believe. Something happens to me that I can't let go. English is not my first language, and this might get long, but please bear with me. I worked in an oldish university, built in the early 20th century of Germany. The four-story building is situated at some kind of hill, so most of it is above ground level, but we also have a huge basement with barely any light coming through the small windows, but some easy accessible exits. It's not possible to enter the building through it though. There are many ways to get from below to the ground floor, and there are some ways that I usually avoid once the sun is down. You see, I study archaeology, and we have a huge collection of plaster casts of famous Roman and Greek artworks. And once it gets dark, like dark dark, it becomes unsettling, and I feel watched pretty quickly. So I just avoid the rooms filled with plaster casts, and everything is fine. So much for the setting. Anyway, so I worked one Saturday evening last summer in my office, which happens to be in the basement as well. At about 8 p.m., I get a strange feeling of being lonely, so I leave my office and look around the building for anyone else to chat up and get a little break. I get up the stairs on my usual route, but there is nobody around. That's not too uncommon for that time of the day on a weekend, so I decide to walk around a bit in our library and then get back to work. Once I entered the library, I noticed growling thunder and the rooms light up by the lightning. After that, it becomes dark. The clouds darken the building as if it's becoming night. That was unsettling, but I know myself. I get creeped out by every little thing because I watch so many horror movies. No big deal, I think to myself, and go back to my office through one of the rooms with the plaster casts. I don't know why I changed my usual routine and went through one of those rooms. Once I'm downstairs, I noticed a weird sound. The storm is continuing with thunderbolts every few moments, but another, very strange sound joins the scenery. It was a metallic sound. The first image that came to my mind was someone hitting a knife against a metal wall. It was raining. I didn't think much of it. It's an old building. Sounds happen. I continued to walk to my office, but then I noticed that the sound was coming closer to me. Still no big deal. Sound travels. I might become scared and start imagining things. Once I get back to my office, the feeling of being watched becomes unbearable. The sound comes closer and closer. It sounded like it was just around the corner, so I packed my things and ran off as fast as I could. I am about to die was the only thought that I had in that moment, and I had to get out. I never experienced that kind of feeling, and it creeped me out more than anything else. The exit to the building is right next to my office. Once I am out, the feeling became even stranger. I looked at the building and noticed that the window of our elevator lit up. There was nobody there. There couldn't be anyone there. The building was closed. Only a few people had access and there was nobody there just a few moments ago. I would have noticed if someone came in. Why use the elevator anyways? It's not an elevator for transportation for people, but for our plaster casts. Everybody just uses the stairs, especially the people that I know that have a key to the building. That's when I noticed that not only there wasn't anyone in the building that I knew of, but there was nobody outside either. I know, it was raining. Why be outside with that kind of weather? But somehow I knew. I was alone. Not alone by the building, but alone, alone. I am not superstitious. I know when I'm freaked out because of my psyche playing tricks on my mind. In that moment, I could have sworn that I was the only person on earth. It was like the whole world wasn't moving anymore. And there was a huge street by the building. Even that was empty. The feeling of being watched did not go away, however. 
but I wasn't as afraid anymore. Some friends wanted to hang out later that evening, so I was waiting for them to pick me up like we planned in the morning. The whole time I could barely move, and I could not take my eyes off that elevator. Once they arrived, I noticed that I must have stood there for about an hour, or what felt like only a few minutes. As I jumped into their car as quickly as I could, everything went back to normal. Suddenly there were cars on the road, sounds. There was no sound except the thunder and the sound of the teardrops hitting the floor before. Everything was back to normal. I must have looked like I had seen death. My friends were really concerned. The next day I went back with a colleague of mine, and we tried out every possibility to recreate the sound I heard. We hit different metal objects with other metal objects, but it wasn't possible to recreate. Everything sounded way deeper than that sound I heard, and more natural. I asked all the other people working in that building who had had the key to the elevator, or who could have been there the night before. But no, nobody was there except for me. They have no reason to lie, some of them are even my teachers. To this day, all of this does not make sense. I know myself. I have never felt that kind of fear before. That basic instinct of you need to get out. Now. So I wanted to ask if any of you has some kind of explanation, be it either a psychological or paranormal one, let me know. As I said, the building is very old. It has seen World War II. It has seen many depressed students. I wish I could make sense out of this situation, because it felt so, so wrong, and different than anything else I've ever experienced. And believe me, I am a huge wuss, so I'm imagining things quite often, and I get the bad feeling that this wasn't just one of my creepy little fantasies. Spring break has always been one of my favorite times of the year. As a child, I used to vacation to the ocean, or sometimes even Disney World. And now as an adult, my wife and I go on vacations together around the time the children are out of school for spring break. For me, there is no better place than the ocean at night. The way the moonlight glows on the waves of the water and the sound of the waves crashing always gives me peace of mind. Well, this particular year, my wife and I saved up a little extra money and rented a private house right on the ocean. It was absolutely amazing drinking my coffee on the ocean every morning and enjoying an alcoholic beverage every night as the moon rose was truly amazing. One day I passed out on the beach for a couple of hours, only to awaken with horrible nightmares. They were strange, and the only thing I remember is darkness and screaming. A lot of screaming. My wife asked me if I was okay, and I said yeah, just a little bit shook up. That night, my wife went to bed fairly early, but I could not sleep. Not sure if it was the long nap I had taken earlier in the day or the horrible nightmares that woke me from said nap. Either way, I wanted to clear my head, so I decided to go for a walk on the beach. As I kept walking on the desolate beach, I approached something that appeared to be glowing in the sand. I started to approach quickly, but with a little bit of caution. It was some sort of glowing red ball. It's kind of hard to describe, but I will do the best I can. It didn't look like cheap plastic. It literally was a glowing red ball of light that didn't seem to have any actual shape. I stared rather intently until it flashed so bright that it knocked me down into the sand. The ball flew up into the air and shot itself out into the ocean. And as it reached the horizon, there was a huge blast of light. Within seconds, the sky looked as if it was storming, but there was no rain. I saw all sorts of colors in the sky, 
and a lot of red flashes that I could only describe as looking like heat lighting. But these flashes were lighting up the entire sky. As I watched all the intense flashes of light, before I knew it, I blacked out completely. The next thing I remember is my wife waking me up the next morning in a frantic panic because she didn't know where I was. I tried explaining to her what I had witnessed, but she said I was just dreaming and was upset with me that I wandered off last night, accusing me of getting drunk and passing out. But it's important to note that I don't get drunk and I would never just wander off and not come back. Something I can't explain happened that night. Can someone let me know what I experienced? Could it have been just a vivid dream that I passed out? Has anyone else experienced something similar? Either way, I know that I don't have the same affinity for oceans and vacations as I did before this occurrence. Rory and I were halfway up Cross Coulour, a huge snow chute on the eastern side of Colorado's Mountain of the Holy Cross, when the snowstorm rolled in, almost a whole day early. That's when we knew that we were in serious trouble. A few days prior, the TV weather forecast had told a completely different story. It reported a clear weather window well within our Thanksgiving break which was one of our only opportunities to tick off Mount of the Holy Cross from our climbing bucket list. We had always bagged several of Colorado's mountains that winter, and we had been eyeing Holy Cross's steep, snow-filled couloir for the previous year. Our plan was to stash some overnight gear at a base camp only a few miles from the start of our climb. From there, we would go for the snowshoot, and then hike out once it was night. We had planned to start the climb in the afternoon, when the snow was just about soft enough to provide our boots with grip. We arrived at the base of the snow chute at around noon. About 300 feet up, the snow was way deeper than expected, but the sky was a clear blue. We were on schedule, and the climb didn't seem like it was going to be too taxing. Additionally, we knew that we would have cell service on top of the peak. We didn't expect to need it, but we considered it a safety net. We were right about the cell service, but we were wrong about the two-hour climb. The higher we went, the deeper the snow became. Soon it was loose and powder, all the way to the rock bed beneath. We were moving more slowly than expected, but if the weather held, we would still make it up before dark. A few hours into the climb, slogging upward within the steep couloir walls, we didn't even notice the dark clouds moving in from the west. The first snows came about halfway through the afternoon. By 5.30 it was pounding down, with the wind drowning out our attempts to communicate. If there ever was a time to quit, that was it. But behind us, the snow was kicked out and slick from our climbing way too unstable for any kind of descent. So, we went with our only viable option, pushing on toward the summit and descending the much easier north ridge as quickly as we could manage. We tried to focus on keeping calm and pushing onward as darkness fell around us. The blizzard flashed through our headlamp beams and pelted our faces with ice. When I looked down at Rory, the terrified look in his eyes perfectly matched how I felt. By the time we finally reached the summit, around seven that evening, we figured the worst was over. We called our parents and told them everything was fine and that we were going to commence the hike down. But when we looked around, we saw only sheer drop-offs and total darkness. There was no way for us to find our descent, which is dangerously easy to miss even in daylight. Plus, the wind up top was blowing something fierce, making it equally hazardous to approach any steep drops. With no choice but to hunker down, 
we settled under an overhanging lip of rock below the summit to wait out the storm. We had what we were wearing, goose down jackets, insulated pants, hats, and gloves, plus a little food and water. We prayed that it would be enough for us to survive. But despite our pleas to the Almighty, conditions soon worsened. Strong winds tore through our improvised shelter, and our feet grew agonizingly cold. We took off our boots and socks and put our feet in each other's armpits, massaging our toes to keep the feeling in them. I couldn't get my mind off of thinking about how my parents would react to the news that we had died up there that night. That's when the severity of our situation started to really dawn on me. We had been feeling pretty cocky up until this point, but now I was truly frightened. Temperatures dropped to negative 20 Fahrenheit with the wind chill that night. I stopped shivering, a sign of hypothermia, but Rory and I stayed positive, and I'm convinced that was the only thing that got us through that night. I must have drifted off, because the next thing I remember was the sun's warmth washing over us. Thankfully, the storm had passed, but the descent was still hard to find. We saw several ridges, and at the bottom of one, we spotted what looked like East Cross Creek, which we'd walked along two days before. We repelled toward it, thinking that we were home free. But when we reached the creek, we realized that we had accidentally gone down the south ridge, the opposite direction of the trailhead. And the one thing we didn't want to do, since at that point we had lost all of our cell service. On the summit the night before, we worried about surviving. Now, we were just annoyed with ourselves. Low on food and extremely tired. Still, we were confident that we would find our way out. Below the tree line, we managed to pick up a trail that took us to a spot we thought we recognized as the east side of the mountain. We weren't ready to admit that our delirious minds may have been playing tricks on us. We followed faint trails through the forest, turning here and there as the compass dictated, but we always ended up back where we started. We later found out locals call the area the Bermuda Triangle of the Rockies. Iron deposits in the rocks can throw off magnetic instruments, and our compass was taking us in circles. We knew that we should have stayed put to wait for rescue, but we couldn't. With water-soaked boots, it was either move or lose appendages to frostbite. Our optimism was running dry. I would start to feel a frog in my throat, but in those moments, you have to either crack a joke or cry. So we messed around, talking about girls, sang old Zeppelin songs, and laughed about whatever we could, any distraction to keep us going. As the sun went down on our second unplanned night out, we gathered tinder and took out our lighters. But to our absolute horror, they remained waterlogged with snow melt. Despite our efforts to dry them, neither of us could get anything so much as a spark out of either of them. By this point, Rory was too weak to continue, so I piled pine branches on the snow for us to spoon on top of. We managed to laugh at a few cuddle jokes, but we were starting to realize that our families didn't know if we were alive. That made it tough to keep things light. Soon we both stopped shivering, and neither of us could feel our feet. Dude, we could die out here, he said. I'm okay with it, because I'm still glad to not be on the couch playing video games. But this is much earlier than I thought it would be. I'm not ready, man. We laid in silence. Rory fell asleep with his head on his right hand, a position that would cut off circulation just enough to give him frostbite in his thumb. Again, temperatures dropped below freezing, and again, we woke up in the morning, somehow still alive. We hadn't been hiking long when we saw a helicopter. It was distant, but for us it took up the whole sky. 
numb feet forgotten, we ran into a meadow, and I waved a jacket and a trekking pole with a bright red hat on it. The chopper flew right past us. It circled back four more times before flying away. We felt like we had watched our last chance vanish. That's when we finally broke down. There was nothing to say. Rory just laid his head on my lap, and we both sobbed. An hour later, the helicopter returned, and this time, it came straight to us. We could not stop smiling. It was finally over. I was so elated, I tried to hug a rescuer, who just threw me into a jump seat and strapped me in. We were told to look for bodies, he said. As soon as we flew off, I could feel the adrenaline drain out of me. My whole body was in pain that I had been too numb to feel until now. But still, I had never felt better. It was honestly one of the lowest, then highest points of my entire life. During the early 2000s, when I was attending law school, I worked nights delivering pizza for one of the national chains. I had done something similar when I was younger and attending my local community college. Anytime I found myself sorely in need of quick cash, that was the avenue I would choose. Despite the many stories I have heard questioning the safety of the job, I never had a single run-in with a thief. I'm sure back in the early days it could be a little dangerous, but by the time I joined the game, companies had learned that implementing practices such as limiting the driver to $20 lowered the chance of holdups drastically. Even though I was never a victim of a robbery, I did have one or two scary incidents I could write about. The worst of these happened to me back in the 2000s. I was very familiar with the city I was living in at the time. Moving there after junior college and delivering for several places over the last five years had made me intimate about almost every nook and cranny of the place. However, one evening, I would be called to an address that I, nor any of the other drivers, even knew existed. When the order came in, I went straight to the map to find the address. But it wasn't there. Not even the GPS on my phone showed it. We didn't have any no-delivery areas at that time, so I had to take it despite my misgivings. Theoretically, the place would have existed if the road continued for ten more blocks, so I turned on to said road a block before its ending and followed it south. Sure enough, a newly paved road began where the old one should have ended. For what seemed like miles, I continued on this new section of road, Nothing stood on either side of it, and I didn't pass another car the whole time. How the state managed to build it without a single report of its creation leaked to the media had me bewildered. The five years I had been driving all over this city, I had not known this part existed. In one way, I was very excited seeing all of it, like a Victorian explorer tracing the source of the Nile but at the same time, a deserted road popping up out of nowhere gave me a chill down my spine. It must have been a good ten minutes before the house in question appeared in the distance. I couldn't understand why someone would build a house out here in the middle of nowhere with no way to reach it. When I got closer, I could see that the house had to be at least fifteen years old or more and probably had not been repaired since then. No cars were around, and for a moment, I thought the house was abandoned, but I could see that the front door was wide open behind the rickety old screen. Everything looked to be above board, so I grabbed the pizza and headed for the door. I knocked on the screen door, but got no answer. I could see what appeared to be a young female walking around the kitchen, when I knocked a second time, 
I heard a female voice say to come in. Despite my reservations, I stepped just inside the house and waited in the small foyer. I had learned from other drivers early on not to enter an unfamiliar house, but I had yet to see anything to concern me. I assumed the woman would be coming out soon to pay me. Instead, I overheard an unseen man whisper, Call him into the kitchen. When I heard that, I fled from the place as fast as I could. I was so freaked out, I got back to the restaurant in half the time it took me to get to the house. After I told my boss what had just occurred, he called the police. All the excitement had me rattled, so my boss sent me home for the day. My phone rang a few hours later. It was the police. They had called to let me know what they had found. Whoever had been there was gone. Even though the place had more than likely been abandoned for a while, they did find evidence that people had just recently been inside. This was stuff my boss had already told them. However, they did shed light on where the road came from and why the house was the only building on an otherwise deserted area. The state had been trying to purchase the land on which the new section of road and house were for 20 years, but the landowner would not sell. They even tried to use eminent domain to get it, but a judge blocked it. Around two years before, the owner passed, and his children finally sold the land to the state. They were so happy to get the land after all that time. The construction on the road was started immediately. It technically had yet to be formally opened, but locals had already began using it anyway. This was good to know, but I still wondered how the two people knew about the empty house sitting in the middle of nowhere. This was something the officer didn't know, of course. We could only assume they drove past it and decided it would be as good a place as any to ambush a delivery driver. Even $20 is a good score if you're desperate enough. He said from personal experience, people had killed for much less. The officer left me with one good piece of news, though. The county had slated the old house to be demolished in the coming week, so no other poor delivery driver would be let out there to be robbed, or worse. Two days later, I was driving down the brand new road, which I was now using as a shortcut across town and witnessed the house's destruction. A load was being lifted from my shoulders right before my eyes. Never again would I enter a customer's home or even deliver to an area in which I was not well-versed. On the night of New Year's Eve 2002, Rachel Moran, a resident of the British East Coast city of Hull, was headed to a party. Like many of her peers, she intended to see out the year in style. She put on her best skirt, carefully applied her makeup, before heading on foot to the nearby celebrations at her mother's house, where her friends and family had festivities in full swing. She saw in the new year with friends, counting the seconds until the change of year like so many others up and down the country. A few hours later, after hours of alcohol and dancing, Rachel decided to head home. But this was the final night of her short life. She would never be seen alive again. A court would later hear that Rachel was stabbed many times before her lifeless body was crammed for weeks in a tiny cupboard inside her killer's flat. The 21-year-old aspiring singer was lured to the flat of a man named Michael Little in the early hours of New Year's Day, then brutally attacked from behind, the court was told. The evidence obtained by various forensic pathologists showed that Michael Little had performed acts with her, but disturbingly enough, it was impossible to say whether this occurred before or after she died. It is alleged that he then wrapped the body in a thin, 
bedroom curtain before concealing it in a small, locked cupboard. Little, who was 23, of Nash Court Hull, has pleaded not guilty to the murder of the striking six-foot-tall blonde in the opening hours of January 2003, a crime that sparked a massive police hunt and united the city in grief when the broken body was finally found. The search for Rachel began after she failed to return to the home she shared with boyfriend Mark Shepard, following the New Year's Eve party at her mother's home in nearby Hall Road. Rachel Moran left the family home to walk back to her own apartment at around 1.40 a.m. on New Year's Day. Prosecutor Jeffrey Marson QC told the court that Rachel hugged her mother, Wanda, and told her she would call her as soon as she arrived home. Wanda Moran would not see her daughter alive again. By tragic coincidence, Michael Little was making his way home along the same route as Rachel. Sometime after about 2.20 a.m., he lured Rachel into his flat. Shortly after they arrived, he attacked her with a large knife. Mr. Marson said that after Michael Little wrapped her body in the curtain and concealed it in the cupboard outside the door to his flat, he set about cleaning up the vast amount of blood using bleach and paper towels. Over the course of the next week or so, Michael Little apparently attempted to separate himself from the evidence of his crimes, disposing of various items of Rachel's personal property by throwing them into a nearby drain. Yet, as Humberside police continued to investigate Rachel's disappearance, highly trained police divers found personal items such as trainers, handbag, passport, bra, and a diary in the drain. The passport was a huge find, and Little had made a serious mistake in disposing of it in the same manner as the other items. It clued police as to who exactly the items belonged to. As a result, they decided to search the nearby groups of houses near to Rachel's Saxe Court home, and Michael Little's nearby flat just happened to be in the designated search area. When police investigators arrived at his home, they began intensively searching his first floor flat, but unfortunately found nothing in their initial attempts. They then asked for a key to the cupboard located near to his front door. A reasonable request, but one that raised extreme suspicion when he repeatedly claimed that he had no key to the cupboard after having accidentally misplaced it police were determined to search it thoroughly, and eventually resorted to brute strength to tear the door from its hinges. Police on scene would later say that they smelled a kind of rotten meat odor coming from the cupboard, and after moving various boxes, found her decomposing body hidden inside. It is thought that she had been stuffed inside the tiny cramped space for almost a month. Prosecutor Jeffrey Marson QC told the court that Michael Little said that the body in the cupboard was her. Marson then quoted Little's statement to the police soon after they had uncovered the damning, rotten evidence. I need to get it off my chest. I have wanted to tell somebody for so long. Michael Little is thought to have said, I can't be normal. I must be evil. A normal person would not do this. The courtroom was shown CCTV footage of Rachel walking to her parents' home on New Year's Eve, and also of her walking home in the early hours of New Year's Day. She was heading home after speaking to her boyfriend, who was at a party on a nearby council estate. CCTV footage showed her in a leather jacket, dress, and white trainers, walking past a local convenience store, the same camera picked up Michael Little walking in exactly the same direction and route as Rachel, about a minute prior to the unfortunate victim. But a CCTV camera near Rachel's home showed that by a few minutes later, Little was walking around 40 seconds behind Rachel. This was overwhelming evidence that he had followed her, maybe even stalked her for a little while, before choosing his moment. Michael Little later claimed to investigating officers that Rachel had ran up to him 
and asked in a friendly manner if she could walk with him because it would make her feel safer. He then invited her to his flat, just a few hundred yards from her own home, where they had a drink. He is alleged to have told police that they had then argued, and he backhanded her. He then claimed that she had slashed his arm with a small knife, and that what followed had been acts of self-defense on his part. Michael Little had been drinking with friends at the Good Fellowship Inn on New Year's Eve before attending a party, leaving to return home at around 1 a.m. The defendant had drunk several pints of beer, alcohol pops, and even a quadruple vodka. Faint bloodstains were found in the hallway of Little's home, and zigzag patterns found by the front door matched Rachel's trainers. Little refused to answer police questions in interview. Prosecutor Jeffrey Martian QC said, It is clear the defendant was responsible for Rachel's death and that he is guilty of murder. Michael Little showed no emotion as a jury at Hull Crown Court found him guilty of the murder of Rachel Moran in the early hours of New Year's Day. If ever there was a murderer deserving of life imprisonment, it is Michael Little. I have taken my yearly journey to the woods to hunt since I was 14. Last year started just as every other one before had, but it would end much earlier and in a very different way than usual. Despite the weather being too warm for hunting, I was out at dawn on opening day like always. As the season drags on, the deer get more skittish, so starting as early as you can increases your chances. On the lease I had been hunting on for the past seven years, I had a small handful of preferred spots, and this is where I was heading. This spot was a tree stand setting roughly 30 feet high in an old oak that looked out across one of our three feed plots. I had had good luck there more than once and hoped to have it again. The drive out to the stand took about 15 minutes from my cabin, so I left an hour before dawn. I wanted to be on the stand just as the first bit of light broke. As usual, I parked my four-wheeler about 50 yards away and walked the rest of the way in. I'm not sure if it makes any real difference, but not making a bunch of noise right next to where I'd be hunting seems like a wise idea. So it's a practice I try to remember to do each time I hunt. Although I had been up over an hour and had a couple of cups of coffee, I was probably a little groggy. I have never been a mornings type of guy, and once I retired, I have gotten up when I woke up. No certain time. So I slung my rifle onto my back and began to climb. About three steps from the top, with the seat in sight, one of my feet slipped from the ladder, and I fell about 25 feet onto my back. Somehow my rifle ended up next to me rather than under. There was no pain at first, so I figured I would just get up and dust myself off. However, I discovered very quickly that at least one, if not both legs, were broken. As I sat up to examine my legs, pain began shooting throughout my back and body. It appeared then that in addition to broken legs, I had a major back injury. My usual high pain tolerance was letting me down and the adrenaline was beginning to wear off. I knew in a matter of minutes I was going to be screaming in pain. I began feeling for my phone and soon found it in my chest pocket. Luckily I didn't land on my chest, right? Being out in the middle of nowhere didn't necessarily mean there wouldn't be any cell service. In my neck of the woods, cell towers are more common than trees. I dialed 911 and waited, but the call dropped. The pain was making me very nauseous and I was having a hard time concentrating. It took me a moment to realize I was going to need to move if I had any chance of getting help. I couldn't think of any other way 
so I gritted my teeth and rolled over onto my stomach. The pain very nearly caused me to pass out, but the stars soon passed, and I began pulling myself forward with my arms. I had made it around 15 yards before I was forced to take a break. Once I had pulled myself together, I tried to call 911 again, but it was a no-go. I looked around and noticed I was still under the trees, but there was a clearing not far away. I gritted my teeth again and pulled myself toward it. I had to take a couple of breaks, but eventually I was in the open. I crossed my fingers and pressed send. The wait was agonizing, but it finally began ringing and I was connected to a dispatcher. The pain made the wait for help to arrive seem even longer, but because of my location and clear directions, they made it to me within 30 minutes. As I laid there, I watched the sunrise, thinking how beautiful a scene it was to see. I only wished it was under better circumstances. By the time I was released from the hospital, a few days later, I would have two broken legs, a broken back, which really amounted to three smashed vertebrae and a mild concussion. The legs would just have to heal with time, but with my back, I've had to have a couple of those vertebrae fused. That surgery was done just a few months before this year's hunting season started, and you can be sure, I was there, waiting for the sun to rise on the first morning. One thing has changed, however. For the time being, I'll be hunting from a blind on the ground. There's no way I'm going to go another year with an empty freezer. Because my parents had separated before I was born, I spent my time growing up between each of their houses. Each summer until I turned 19, I stayed with my dad in rural Missouri. He had grown up in the area himself, and most of his family still lived there. Without much to do, like going to the movies and stuff, I would fill my days hanging out with my older cousin and getting into mischief. Many of our long summer days were taken in wandering the surrounding woods. On one of these journeys, we came across a big lake setting, quietly by itself out in the middle of nowhere. The water was crystal clear and filled with tons of monstrous fish. We asked the adults if they were aware of its existence, but none had heard of it. That was probably the reason for it having so many large fish. No one living in the area had fished it, and any who had in the past allowed its location to be lost. We would fish the pond three or four times, coming away with a stringer full of lunkers on each occasion. On the fifth occasion, we hoped to accumulate enough for a big family fish fry. The summer holiday was starting to wind down, and we figured a fish fry would be a great way to cap it off. It was a warm Saturday morning when we headed out. We started about an hour before sunup because the walk-in took over an hour. Besides, the fish stopped biting by the hottest part of the day, and we hoped to get back to my dad's house by early afternoon. The beautiful side of the pond came into view around dawn. It didn't take long for us to get our first bites, and for the next three hours, the fish came quickly one after another. Our limit was caught by 10.45, and I was rearing to get going. We had a 90-minute walk back with two five-gallon buckets packed to the top with fish, so I imagined another 30 could be added to that. To my displeasure, my cousin thought it would be refreshing to take a dip in the lake before we left. He tried to pressure me into joining him, but I didn't know how to swim at the time. I just wanted to get back, but he was older than me, so he was in charge. I plopped my tail onto a rock and waited while he did his thing. There was an old rope tied to a tree, probably from a hundred years ago, 
and he wanted to swing from it. It looked unsafe to me. However, my concerns were laughed off, and he stripped down to his boxers, setting his clothes on the ground next to me. He climbed the tree a little way and grabbed the rope. Pushing off, he swung out just a short distance before the rope snapped right above him. He had made it out far enough to hit the deep water, but probably not as far as he intended. When he hit the water, his body made a dull thud sound. It certainly didn't sound normal and likely hurt. I was planning on laughing at him and saying I told you so, but as the seconds passed, he never resurfaced. The situation was quickly becoming scary. I looked around to see if he came up somewhere farther away, perhaps floating unconscious because of the hard contact with the water, but still nothing. I was beginning to panic and waited out as far as I dare, looking into the water for him. Unfortunately, the water became so cloudy with every step I took and made it impossible to see. Soon, it was clear to me that he had drowned. How? I had no idea. Perhaps if I could have swam back then, I may have been able to help him. But it was too late now. I was helpless to do anything more than pick up and head home. On the entire walk back, a small nugget of hope lingered in the back of my mind. That maybe he had tricked me, and he would pop out at some point. This did not happen, however, and the dread I carried of telling my family grew with each step. I tried several times to find the words, but with each attempt I would break down and choke on my tears. Ultimately, I could only manage. Mark drowned. They got the point, and after, once I was able to pull myself together, I led my dad and my uncle back to the pond. Mark's body was still nowhere to be found. With no other options, we went into the sheriff's office to report the drowning. When I realized where we were headed, I started freaking out. In my young mind, I thought I was going to get in trouble or be blamed for my cousin's death. It took a few minutes, but they were able to convince me that I was not in trouble. Even after they had, I couldn't help but feel guilty every time I looked at my uncle, regardless of what he claimed. I couldn't believe that he did not blame me, even if it was just a small amount. I explained what happened to the sheriff, and the search began the next morning. Just by chance, that was the day I was going back to my mom's. That Monday night, my mom sat me down to tell me that a team of divers had found Mark's body earlier that day. When they discovered him, one of his feet were hung up on a sunken log, so they assumed that was why he never surfaced. I wish I could say this made me feel better, but it didn't. It did, however, serve as a catalyst to learn how to swim. The guilt of not being able to help my cousin stayed with me for most of my life, and I never wanted to be in the position of not being able to help another person ever again. So, in a twisted kind of way, his death had a positive impact on my life. However, if I had the choice, I'd prefer that he still be with us. Back when it was originally released, I really, really wanted to get my hands on the new Xbox One X. You know the one. It was 4K ready with a considerably faster processor. So, naturally, I tried absolutely everything in my power to get one as immediately as I could. My local Walmart was having one of those Black Friday sales and, like so many others, I stood patiently in line waiting to try and beat the rush to grab one. But I was nowhere near sprightly or fortunate enough to actually get one that way. So after failing to get one in person, I then tried getting one 
online. But as rapidly as I wanted to own one, the users who were reselling them were asking way, way too much money. And I simply couldn't afford to shell out double or sometimes triple the price. After weeks of trying to find a way to get a hold of one, I had to come to the conclusion that it just was not meant to be. It was then that I had something of a stroke of luck. Although I had resorted to Craigslist in my desperation, I did actually find someone that was selling their Xbox One X at no more than the original buying price of the console. Naturally, I was skeptical. For the life of me, I simply could not fathom why they would do something like that. But one thought overrode all others. If I didn't put in a bid now, someone else would, and I could kiss my chance of owning a 1X goodbye. I immediately emailed the seller and let them know that I was very interested. Not only that, but I had the cash on hand and ready to go. I also offered to pay for gas or whatever it would take to get the console delivered to my door. I figured that would be a pretty appealing offer to someone who I guessed was just strapped for cash around the holidays. I was stunned to get an almost instantaneous response, stating that they did still have the Xbox, and were in fact still waiting for a proper bid from a serious buyer. They politely asked for a delivery address so they could bring it over as soon as possible. I was sort of hesitant to divulge such personal information and asked if it would be a better idea to first meet in public since it was much safer that way. I'll be honest, I wasn't too pleased with the idea of a total stranger coming to my house. But he informed me that he was going to be very busy running holiday errands all day and that there would only be some pretty specific windows of opportunity to drop it off. It would be much more convenient for him if he was able to come over to my house. I was still not particularly ecstatic about the idea, but oh man, I really, really wanted that new 4K Xbox. So in the end, I agreed and texted the dude my home address. I figured it was safer than me going over to his place. At least this way, I would be on home turf. I was so happy and eager to get my hands on that new console, and that excitement only grew as I began waiting for the guy to turn up. But he took his sweet time. I mean hours and hours passed by before I began to suspect that he wasn't going to actually show. Around one in the afternoon, four hours after he was due, I was seriously losing my cool, thinking it was a prank or something. I tried texting the guy back, asking him where he was. Previously, I had gotten pretty timely responses from the guy, but this time, I didn't hear a single thing from him. By six o'clock that evening, I lost all hope. I assumed that he had gotten a better offer from someone else and didn't have the heart to tell me that he had picked a new buyer. I was disappointed, more than words can possibly describe. I had gotten myself so psyched, I can't even tell you how deflated I was. It's one thing to not have gotten the item from the store. I could come to terms with that. But I was so close to having one in my hands. It sucked having my hopes dashed so cruelly like that. But that didn't mean I had given up entirely. So, for the rest of the night, I kept looking around on Craigslist and other sites to find a new Xbox One X that was within my price range. But as I was getting ready to wind down for bed, I heard something. At first, I dismissed it as the wind or something, that it was maybe just my imagination. But then I heard it again. Someone was knocking, not at my front door, but lightly on the TV room window. I walked up to the bedroom window and peered out into the driveway, seeing this strange-looking guy at my front door, looking around, as if checking the coast is clear. I'm suspicious, but I do go downstairs to see what he wants. He identified himself as the guy who had the Xbox, apologized for being so late, and explained that he had gotten backtracked with errands during his day. Then. 
He casually asked if I still had the money. I opened the door all the way, but still kept the screen door closed as a precaution. Something just didn't feel right, like at all. I told him that yeah, I still had the cash on me, but I didn't see that he had anything with him, so I calmly asked if he brought the Xbox with him, like if it's still in his car or something. As I expected, he told me that it was out in his van. He told me to get the money and come out to the van with him, and he would get it for me. I let him know I wasn't really comfortable walking out to his van, but he seems to understand and tells me it's all good. I briefly look over the guy's shoulder and see that there is, in fact, someone else sitting there in the van. Not only that, but the guy at my door has been keeping his hands concealed in a little front pouch in his hoodie the entire time that he was talking to me. And there was definitely something more than just his hands in there. Don't ask me how I could tell. I just could. You know when you just get a gut feeling about something? Yeah, that. I try to stay as chill as possible as I lie to him that I would just go to fetch my wallet and I would return in a minute. His mood immediately changed as I close the door in his face before locking it. I then make the split second decision, better to be safe than sorry, so I pull my phone out of my shorts and dial 911. But as I do, I heard a loud thud on my front door, then the sound of the van's engine revving before it zooms off into the night. When I went to check to see if he damaged my door, I nearly pissed my pants when I saw a rusty old hatchet buried in the wood. I was right that he had something in his sweatshirt and that I should not go out to the van with him. Be careful who you're buying from, folks. You never know who's behind the username. Although what I'm about to tell you may sound like one of your run-of-the-mill horror movies, I swear by the validity of it and what I saw. It all started on a very hot July day this past year. My car is almost 20 years old and sometimes overheats on hot days, just like this one. However, until I get a better paying job, it's the car I'm stuck with. This day, I was driving through the back roads looking for a family of dog breeders a friend of mine had told me about. I had been searching for the place for several hours and was approaching the warmest part of the day. As per usual, my car began overheating and I was forced to pull over. I picked up my phone to call my girlfriend, only to see that my battery was dead. After I spent a couple of minutes cussing my luck, I acknowledged that I was going to have to find someone with a working phone. That wasn't going to happen unless I started walking. Soon, I spotted an old farmhouse off in the distance and headed toward it. A trip that would have taken half an hour on a normal day took almost an hour because of the oppressive heat. I had to take several breaks during the course of the journey, but eventually made it. The area around the house looked more like a junkyard Parts of old cars spread about, and I had to weave through a maze of them to reach the front door. I knocked on the door for several minutes but got no answer. Thinking maybe the homeowner may be hard of hearing, I walked around and looked into the windows, hoping to see someone inside. At the side of the house, I spotted a telephone hanging on the wall, just inside the kitchen. Now that I knew there was a phone there, I became excited and started calling out for someone. Even after walking all the way around, no reply came. I was about to give up until I saw a woman laying on a bed. I very nearly banged on the window to try to get her attention, but I figured that may scare her, so I went back to the front door and let myself in. In hindsight, that was just as scary. Before I entered, however, I took a piece of paper from a notebook I carry with me 
and wrote out a note explaining what I was doing there. Even then, I called out several times as I approached the bedroom. Still no answer came, and I continued toward the room. The closer I got to the woman, the more her appearance began to unnerve me. She was laying flat on her back and staring blankly at the ceiling. I had initially believed she was watching the television that was turned on in the room with her, but her eyes sat completely still. Regardless, I got closer, and once I was within a few steps, handed her the note. When the note touched her hand, she did not react. This caused me to get closer, and this was when I realized something was very wrong. Her face had a very dry, almost mummified look to it. Her hair was a vibrant black, a color not often seen on older females. She had to have known I was there by that point, but her eyes stayed fixed. This is what caused me to lean in even closer and look into her eyes. Rather than being a slightly bloodshot or moist looking like most people's, they had a shiny, glassy appearance, like they were fake. In spite of this, not until I actually touched her, did I know for sure that she was dead. I realized that perhaps she was a mannequin rather than a human, so I reached down to touch her bare hand. The texture of her skin was dry, but stone cold to the touch. The oddity of this was just beginning to really sink in when a loud creaking noise came from behind me. Without a second thought, I tore out of there and ran back down the road in the direction of my car. Within half of a mile, I ran into an older man in a truck, and he agreed to give me a ride back into town. I said nothing about my experience to him, and any time he attempted to make small talk, I said as little as I could. He let me borrow his phone to call my girlfriend, and she agreed to meet us at a gas station on the edge of town. When he let me out of there, I thanked him, and he went on his way. Once I was safely inside my girlfriend's car, I borrowed her phone to call the police. I hadn't even told her about it yet, so the look of shock on her face as I described what I saw showed me what my expression likely was at the time I discovered it. The cops said they would send a car out to the house to check out my claims. I called a wrecker next to pick up my car. The police never called me back, so after waiting three days, I called to inquire about what they found. It took a few minutes to find a person aware of my call, but once I did, the officer said that he and his partner searched the entire property and found nothing out of the ordinary, especially not a mummified woman. I thanked them and hung up the phone. What happened after I fled? I can only guess. The noise behind me was probably the owner of the home, and he hid the woman's body, knowing that the cops were likely to be called. To tell you the truth, I'm not sure what I saw in that house, on that bed. I am positive that I saw a human laying on that bed, but that's all. More than once, I have been tempted to grab a camera and return to that house to get proof of my claims, but fear of the unknown and what else could be waiting for me if I did has stopped me. If the nightmares of her soulless eyes continue, however, I may have no other choice. John Benet Ramsey was born in 1990 in Atlanta, Georgia, the younger of two children of Patsy and John Ramsey. John Ramsey was a successful businessman who was the president of Access Graphics, a computer system company that would later be bought up and absorbed by the Titanic Lockheed Martin. So in 1991, John and Patsy moved their family to Boulder, Colorado, where Access Graphics' new headquarters was to be located. Patsy Ramsey was a regular on the junior pageant scene and entered their daughter in various child beauty pageants that were held in Boulder. 
Jean Benet would prove popular on the pageant scene, winning the titles of America's Royal Miss, Little Miss Charlevoix, Little Miss Colorado, Colorado State All-Star Kids Cover Girl, and National Tiny Miss Beauty. Jean Benet's active role in child beauty pageants and Patsy's reported pageant mother behavior were common knowledge among their friends, family, and fellow contestants. According to the statements that Patsy gave to the authorities on December 26, 1996, she realized that her daughter was missing after she found a two-page handwritten ransom note on the kitchen staircase. The hastily scrawled note, written in black marker pen, demanded $118,000 for their child's safe return. John pointed out to police that the amount was nearly identical to his Christmas bonus of the prior year, which suggested that someone who would have had access to that information would be involved in the crime. Investigators looked at several theories behind the dollar amount demanded and seriously considered employees at Access Graphics who may have known of the amount of John Pryor's bonus as suspects. By most standards, the ransom note was unusually long. The FBI told the police that it was very unusual for such a note to be actually written at the crime scene during the crime itself. This led police to believe that the note was staged due to it not having any fingerprints except for Patsy's and authorities who had handled it and because it included an unusual amount of exclamation marks and initialisms. The note and a practice draft were written with a pen and pad of paper from the Ramsey home. According to a Colorado Bureau of Investigation report, there were indications that the author of the ransom note was Patricia Ramsey herself. However, a federal court ruled it highly unlikely that Patsy wrote the note citing six certified handwriting experts. Meanwhile, John Ramsey made arrangements to pay the ransom as a forensics team was dispatched to the house. The team initially believed that the child had been kidnapped and Jean Benet's bedroom was the only room in the house that was cordoned off to prevent contamination of evidence. Boulder Police Detective Linda Arndt arrived early the next morning with the goal of awaiting the kidnapper's instructions. But there was never an attempt by anyone to claim the money. It was then that detectives made a horrifying discovery. One of the plain clothes detectives asked John Ramsey and Fleet White, a family friend, to search the house to see if anything seemed suspicious. They started their search in the basement. John opened the latched door and was horrified to find his daughter's body in one of the rooms. Jean Benet's mouth was gagged with duct tape. A nylon cord had bound her wrists and neck, while her torso was covered by a white blanket in an attempt to conceal the corpse. But it could not mask the smell. John Ramsey picked up the child's body and took it upstairs. The autopsy revealed that Jean Benet had been killed on Christmas Day by strangulation and skull fracture. There was no evidence of conventional abuse of any kind, although police refused to rule out a sexual motive for the murder. Although no bodily fluid was found, there was evidence that there had been an injury to the girl's private parts. At the time of the autopsy, a pathologist recorded that it appeared her private area had been wiped with a cloth. A garrote that was made from nylon cord had been tied around Jean Benet's neck and was apparently used to strangle her. The autopsy revealed a vegetable or fruit material which may represent pineapple, which Jean Benet had eaten a few hours before her death. Photographs of the home taken on the day when Jean Benet's body was found show a bowl of pineapple on the kitchen table with a spoon in it. However, Neither John or Patsy said they remembered putting the bowl on the table or feeding pineapple to Jean Benet. If this was true, then Jean Benet had been fed by whatever stranger had murdered her. A highly disturbing detail, indeed. Boulder police initially focused almost exclusively upon John and Patsy as suspects in their daughter's killing, 
but by October of 1997, police had over a thousand people in their index of persons of interest for the case. However, a grand jury was convened on September 15, 1998, the main being to consider indicting the Ramses for charges relating to the case. In 1999, the grand jury returned a true bill to charge the Ramses with placing the child at risk in a way that led to her death and with obstructing an investigation of murder based on the probable cause standard applied in such grand jury proceedings. But Boulder County District Attorney Alex Hunter did not prosecute them because he did not believe that he could meet the higher standard of proving guilt beyond a reasonable doubt that is required for a criminal conviction in the state of Colorado. However, many years later in 2015, Boulder Police Chief Mark Beckner disagreed with completely exonerating the Ramses, stating, Exonerating anyone based on a small piece of evidence that has not yet been proved to even be connected to the crime is absurd. He also stated that the unknown DNA from Jean Benet's clothing has got to be the focus of the investigation. At this point in time, until one can prove otherwise, the suspect is the donator of that unknown DNA. In 2016, Gordon Coombs, a former investigator for the Boulder County District Attorney's Office, also questioned total absolution of the Ramses, stating, We all shed DNA all the time within our skin cells. It can be deposited anywhere, at any time, for various reasons. Reasons that are benign. To clear somebody just on the premise of touch DNA, especially when you have a situation where the crime scene wasn't secure at the beginning, really is a stretch. Stephen E. Pitt, a forensic psychiatrist hired by Boulder authorities, said, The public exoneration of the Ramses was a big slap in the face to Chief Beckner and the core group of detectives who had been working on the case for years. However, it seems the twists and turns in the case never stopped. John Mark Carr, a 41-year-old elementary school teacher, was arrested in Bangkok, Thailand on August 15, 2006, when he falsely confessed to murdering Jean Benet. He claimed that he had drugged, assaulted, and accidentally killed her. Yet authorities also said they did not find any evidence linking Carr to the crime scene. In his confession, Carr had provided only basic facts that were publicly known and failed to provide any convincing details. His claim that he had drugged Jean Benet was doubted because the autopsy indicated that no drugs were found in her body. What's more, DNA samples that were taken from Carr did not match DNA found on Jean Benet's body. We may never know who actually murdered Jean Benet Ramsey. But one thing is certain, what should have been a jolly family holiday was turned into a living nightmare by a killer who may never face justice for their crimes. This is the story of the day I learned to really trust my instincts. What I refer to is nothing metaphysical, but rather an educated gut feeling based on our life lessons and general alertness. I say that because my family made sure to teach me about bad people, but I think it was my own instincts that potentially saved me from a terrible trauma. When I was around six or seven, my grandparents lived in a big city on an apartment building that had three apartments per floor. My grandma was good friends with the next door neighbor, which was a middle-aged woman named Marley. She lived with her also middle-aged husband, who I'll call Theo. When I say next door, I mean their door was glued to my grandma's. The corridor was small and cramped, with a security metal door separating my grandma's and Marley's door from the rest. Since the town was very dangerous, this metal door served as extra protection for both apartments. Theo was a big, quiet man with a round belly. He had a classic mustache 
and never really visited my grandma's apartment when Marley did. Therefore, I don't think my parents nor grandparents were that familiar with him. I used to visit my family every weekend, and sometimes my five-year-old cousin would be over as well. We were both generally quiet girls, and we often played together around the apartment. Being the eldest, I was always given the responsibility to take care of my cousin. She could be very difficult to control sometimes, but I tried my best, and thank God I did. One afternoon we were playing, when my grandma announced that she was going out with Marley. I don't remember where my parents and granddad were, but they were not home. It was okay for me to stay a few hours by myself, since my grandma wouldn't take long, and my mom had taught me, from an early age, to be very independent. The apartment wouldn't be locked, though, because the outer metal door would. My grandma used to say that, if I ever needed any help, I could call Marley or Theo. I never wanted to actually need them, because that would mean an emergency or something scary like that but I felt a sense of safety knowing there were adults nearby. That sense of safety could not be more wrong. Everyone left, and me and my cousin stayed by ourselves. It was really hot that day, and we were wearing light summer clothes. I don't recall the exact reason, but sometime later, my cousin decided she would go over to Marley's apartment and play over there. I guess she was bored or something like that, and decided to venture over to the unknown, as she put it. Instantly I knew this was a bad idea. I had never been over to their place, but something hit my gut the wrong way when my cousin suggested that. I can't explain that feeling of dread, but I do remember how unwilling I was to go, and how I tried to convince her otherwise. My cousin, however, didn't listen to me and just ran over, knocking on their door. I heard Theo's deep voice inviting us in, and we did. The apartment itself was very standard for the 90s. Wooden furniture, bad art on the walls, dinner table with some ugly centerpiece, etc. Nothing creepy about it. What was creepy, though was how Theo stared at us from the start. He was sitting on a lounge chair, wearing a white buttoned shirt with the top buttons opened. He was sweaty, and it showed on his clothes and hair. I remember this in detail, because I felt immediately grossed out. Without taking his eyes off of me, Theo greeted us, inquiring about our visit and whatnot, trying to appear friendly. I held my cousin's hand as we stayed in the middle of the living room, kind of testing the ambiance. I wanted to bolt out of there, but my cousin was very curious and started to walk around, exploring the cabinets, tables, and decor. All the while, Theo was rambling on about things I don't really recall. My cousin was still exploring and answering things sporadically. Suddenly, Theo said something that made my chest explode with a sudden release of tension. He called me pretty, cute, and polite. He asked if I wanted to sit on his lap and smiled. I hate to recall this moment because it felt like some kind of violence was imminent. My instincts were screaming that this was a dangerous place to be. Finally, I managed to say no thanks and turned around. My cousin was nowhere to be seen. Anger and fear boiled inside of me. What if this huge, sweaty man decided to grab us? What if he did something bad, or locked us up forever? These were possibilities in my head, while I looked for my cousin and called her name. I finally found her looking at something in the kitchen. She asked why I was crying and that's when I realized it myself. This was how nervous I felt around Theo. I think he might have been calling for us, trying to lure us back closer to him, but I don't remember. I guess he had a bad leg or knee, 
because he didn't move much or get up. All I know is that I didn't run, but firmly grabbed my cousin by her arm and dragged her back to our grandma's apartment. I couldn't lock the door, so in my childish desperation, I created a barrier with a bunch of chairs and waited until my family came home. My cousin was upset, but she quickly forgot about it. When my mom arrived, I was very nervous, but managed to tell her. For some weird reason, I felt really ashamed. However, she wasn't mad at me, but was incredibly concerned and told me I did the right thing. Because any adult who did something like that was not to be trusted. Of course, we were consequently prohibited to go over to Marley and Theo's apartment, or even talk to them. I didn't mind one bit. I actually welcomed this decision. So far, the encounter would have been creepy enough to any child or teenager, but it got worse a few years later. After my mom had a chance encounter with Marley when she was on vacation. My mom was traveling with my aunt, and they were having breakfast at the hotel when they spotted Marley from a distance. Mom tells me that she didn't say hello, just pointed Marley out to my aunt, and nothing more. But then my aunt casually mentioned that Marley was alone because her husband Theo had been arrested a few years back. He had been given a long sentence, so the case was pretty serious. He was arrested for being a predator. My mom was shocked because she had no idea he was in jail. She called me right away and told me. I was already a teenager, but still felt a knot in my stomach, remembering that afternoon with my cousin. Marley even tried to say hello to my mom, but my mom just ignored her and stepped away. It serves Marley right, because the story is that she knew what Theo did and kept quiet. To this day, whenever I think of that tense, dreadful encounter with Theo, I am drenched with disgust, but thankfully, also with relief. The car's engine revved as I sped down the road. I was lost in thought and hardly took notice of the rain crashing against my windshield. Nature seemed to sense my anger. The storm was rising. I poured more vodka down my throat, my eyes constantly darting to the shiny black handgun lying on the passenger seat. Brushing the cold metal with the tip of my fingers, my mind involuntarily flooded with images of my oldest daughter, Mara. Her entire life played through my mind in mere seconds. My last memory of Mara was from when I had to identify her body in the morgue. My hands began to shake. An uncontrollable tremor spread through my body. I pulled over the car, unable to continue, and slammed my fist against the steering wheel. The images of the morgue would not leave me I closed my eyes. There she was, lying on a metal table. A blanket had been carefully draped over her body, only revealing her pale face. She had just turned 16. Death seemed to have aged her well beyond that. The pathologist placed his hand on my shoulder. I had not been able to comprehend any of his words. The man's actions had seemed so forced and well-practiced, it only angered me more. I had asked for a moment alone. After the doctor left, I hesitantly placed my hand on my daughter's cheek. Almost instantly, I pulled it back. She had felt so cold. I stared at her lower abdomen where I knew the knife had pierced her. For a fraction of a second, I contemplated pulling away the blanket and exposing the wound, but I could not muster the strength. She looked peaceful now, as if she was sleeping. I feared exposing the wound which had killed her would somehow change that. 
That had been a little over a month ago. The police had quickly caught the youth who committed the crime. Some bum who had attempted to rob her and wielded his knife a little too over enthusiastically. He had murdered her, although she had given him her purse. I punched the wheel again. It wasn't fair. The youth's trial was yesterday. He'd been acquitted on account of procedural mistakes by the police. The man had smiled at me as they let him out of the courtroom. It wasn't fair. That bum had destroyed my life at an astounding rate. My wife could barely stand to look at me anymore. A week ago, she moved out of the house and took our youngest daughter with her. She told me I needed help. She said she couldn't watch me ruin my life. I didn't blame her. This past month, I found solace in liquor. I could not let go of my pain. It festered into an uncontrollable rage. All I could think about was the injustice of it all. All I could see was the pale face of my dead daughter. All I wanted was to kill the man responsible. It became an obsession. I had been unable to console my wife. My youngest daughter had practically not spoken since the loss of her sister. I found her quietly curled up in Mara's bed most days, unable to let go, unable to move on. It broke my heart. I had felt a strange sense of relief watching them both drive off. I did not need them to see what happened next. I did not want my youngest daughter to witness her dad being dragged away for murder. I preferred the solitude and the warm embrace of alcohol. My eyes darted back towards the gun and I sighed. I had to do this. Otherwise, I would never know peace. Determined, I turned the ignition key. The car purred gently before reverting into stillness. I turned the key again. Nothing happened. I cursed loudly and tried again. Nothing. I took out my frustration on the steering wheel until both my hands ached. I grabbed my phone ready to call a tow truck, but it would not switch on. The wind howled outside. I checked my watch, but it had stopped working. Everything seemed to be in suspension. After a short internal debate, I decided. The thought of remaining in the car suddenly seemed unbearable. Feeling restless, I kicked open the door and got out of the car, hastily stuffing my weapon in my jacket pocket. The storm was livid. The rain poured with such force, it temporarily deafened all other thoughts coursing through my mind. I was drenched within seconds, but it didn't bother me. I started walking down the road, crossing a little bridge across a river. Mumbled curses escaped my mouth as I realized I was lost. A cold mist lazily enveloped me. Not knowing what else to do, I continued walking until a distant light pierced through the gray veil. Like a moth, I gravitated towards it. Its source, a small bus stop. Relieved to have found some cover, I fell back into one of the metal seats. My hands were numb. I rubbed them together for a couple moments before reaching into my pocket for my pack of cigarettes. After taking a long drag, I closed my eyes and leaned back against the bus stop. Slowly, I blew out a cloud of smoke and the tremor subsided. Without instruction, my mind drifted back towards the youth who had killed my daughter. A familiar doubt fell over me. I had always valued human life. As a family man, I had constantly tried to maximize everyone's happiness. Now here I was, committed to blowing a hole in the head of my daughter's murderer. I turned around and looked at my reflection in the glass. 
I could no longer recognize the pale, lined face staring back at me. Droplets of rain slowly slid down the glass. It gave my reflection even more of a somber appearance. I looked back out in front of me and took another drag from the clammy cigarette stuck between my fingers. Closing my eyes, I exhaled, expelling another cloud of smoke. Rough day? The voice startled me. The cigarette slipped from my grasp and fell down my shirt. I jumped up, swearing as ash scorched my chest. Jesus! I muttered at the young boy standing before me. The boy grinned. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to startle you. I shrugged and sat back down. The boy took a seat beside me. It holds a strange beauty, doesn't it? I glanced at him. What does? He nodded out at the storm. There was a silence. I broke it by standing and pacing up and down the little bus stop. When is the bus going to get here? The boy gave me an appraising look. I'm afraid no bus can take you to where you want to go, John. I absentmindedly shrugged off his words and lit another cigarette. After my first drag, it hit me. I stared at the boy. He stared back. A latent intensity burned in his eyes. How do you know my name? I know a great many things. I snorted. Sure. I know the pain you feel, John. I have seen it before, many times. I crushed the pack of cigarettes in my hand, feeling a fresh wave of anger crash over me. You don't know me! The boy gave me a sad smile. I have seen this before. Someone loses someone close to them. As a result, you feel rage build deep inside of you, fueled by guilt because you weren't able to prevent what happened. Unable to see that it was beyond your control to begin with, you could never have changed what happened. Yet you cannot forgive yourself either. The mind cruelly tortures the body until your heart is riddled with sorrow. Now your existence is anguish. You wish you had been the one to die because the thought of living on just seems too difficult. Living in this world does not seem bearable at the sight of such a loss. I remained speechless, unable to comprehend the little boy beside me. The boy sighed and scratched the back of his head. I've seen this before. After a while, it all begins to look the same. The faces may change, but emotion remains constant. Your face is lined, as so many before you. A canvas of hate and anger. The boy sighed again and jumped to his feet. Murder will not bring her back. I spun towards the boy. What did you say? Mara is gone. Murder will not bring her back. The boy spoke the words so casually, it took me a moment to register them. Then, before I could stop myself, I slammed the boy against the glass wall. The entire bus stop trembled. Don't you say that name? I shouted. Tears began streaming down my face. Don't say it! The boy stared at me with a blank expression. He put his hand around mine and slowly pulled loose from my grip, his fingers hard as iron. I feel for you. I really do. Your daughter deserved better. Shut up! I know you think revenge will dull the pain. That somehow using that thing in your pocket will make you feel better. I fished out the weapon. The boy stared at it. Something dark swept across his face. He briefly held out his hand before suddenly retracting it as if the weapon had electrocuted him. That will not solve your problems. That guy deserves to die. 
I spat out the words with as much bile as I could muster. Then I fell back into the metal seat, suddenly exhausted. My heart felt like it was going to explode out of my chest. I took some deep breaths in an attempt to calm myself. The boy stood motionless, staring at the falling rain. You know, it never gets easier. He finally muttered. After all these years of helping people cross over, it still remains difficult to let go sometimes. Some deaths are so much more deserving than others. I should not judge anyone, yet I cannot help but feel for some of them. Occasionally, the ones I meet radiate such light, it pains me to extinguish it. I don't always want to, but I have no choice. My existence is one of duty. The boy radiated an eerie calmness as he spoke. I felt my heartbeat returning to normal. Who are you? How do you know these things? The boy gave me a sad smile. I guess I am a traveler. Everyone will meet me at some point in their lives, whether it is in the beginning or the end or somewhere in between. I don't understand. The boy shrugged. I wouldn't expect you to. The boy looked at his watch. The bus should be here any minute. As soon as he had spoken the words, two lights cut through the inky darkness. The bus stopped before us and the doors slid open. The boy climbed up the little staircase. Once he got to the top, he spun around. I have never done this before, but will you take a short journey with me, John? Where are we going? The boy shrugged. I'm not sure yet. All I know is that you should join me for this. I hesitantly looked at the boy. There was something about him. I felt compelled to join him. I took the boy's hand and climbed up the stairs behind him as the doors closed. The bus driver was old, very old. A shroud of matted white hair draped around his shoulders. Icy blue eyes stared at us. I instinctively pulled out my wallet and passed him some cash. The boy laughed and held back my hand. I'm afraid that won't work. I don't have anything else. The boy tapped my wristwatch. Show him that. I stuck out my arm towards the driver. He stared at it before also tapping the watch a couple of times and inspecting the unmoving dials. Seemingly satisfied, he waved us inside. The boy hurried towards the back of the deserted bus and waved me over. I sat quietly beside him. Where are we going? The boy grinned. This journey is not about destination, per se. Then what is it about? It's about everything, the boy exclaimed. And also about nothing. The boy must have recognized the exasperation on my face. He cleared his throat. You should consider yourself lucky, John. I laughed humorlessly. I should consider myself lucky? Lucky that my daughter is dead? Lucky that my other child had barely spoken in weeks? The boy's eyes grew hard. Having someone you love ripped away before their time is difficult. I understand that. Do you really? I muttered sarcastically. More than you could possibly imagine. The boy replied coolly. I have guided many people before their time. I have comforted both young and old, held the hands of both murderers and the murdered. I have held newborn babies and taken children from their parents' embrace. I have walked the fields of countless battles. I have waded through rivers of blood. Wherever I go, the dead follow, like moths attracted to a flame. You could not comprehend the endless sorrow I must navigate. 
He wiped a single tear from his eye. Within them, I only saw grief. As if his words had opened an old wound. I felt sorry for him. Sometimes I feel so far away from everything. The boy continued. I worry I have become too indifferent. That I will fulfill my duty without truly understanding what it is I should be doing. I felt like a spectator watching eternity unfold itself. I offer hope to those I meet whenever I can, without knowing whether my words are true or not. I have no idea what comes after this, John. I wish I knew. I wish I understood my purpose. My life is a paradox. My existence is perennial, and yet one of insufferable solitude. You must feel lonely. The boy nodded. After that, we sat together in silence. The boy stared out the window. He seemed deep in thought. I felt my eyelids grow heavy, and before long, I had fallen asleep. I woke up disoriented. The bus was deserted, and for a moment, I thought I had dreamed my encounter with the boy. Then the bus driver turned around. His blue eyes pierced through me, and he pointed towards the little hill that we were parked beside. He's waiting. With a quick nod, I jumped off the bus. I reached the top of the little hill, panting. The boy leaned against a tree and observed the spectacle unraveling itself below. A small crowd had fathered before a tiny grave. A priest stood reading from the Bible. His actions seemed almost mechanical in their repetition. Why are we here? The boy remained silent. Whose funeral is this? The boy nodded at the crowd down below. You know whose funeral this is. I quickly scanned the crowd, only recognizing familiar faces. Is this my funeral? Is that what this is about? Are you showing me what will happen if I murder Mara's killer? You know, the boy repeated, his voice a mere whisper. I looked at the people occupying the front row of chairs. My family was nowhere to be seen. My youngest daughter's godparents sat before the pitiful hole in the ground. They held each other as they cried. My knees suddenly felt weak. Slowly, I slid to the floor as tears soaked the earth around me. Where am I? Jail. A simple yet sober reply. Where is my wife? The boy's eyes remained on the little crowd below as he scratched the back of his head. She is not here, John. Where is she? I sobbed so hard, the words left in a single slur. Your wife found her. After you were taken away, the little girl could not cope anymore and hung herself in Mara's room. Your wife was unable to handle the strain and had a breakdown. She is currently forcibly restrained in an asylum two hours away. Next week she will suffer a stroke. The boy glanced at me, his eyes riddled with pity. She will never recover. Slowly her will to live will siphon away until only the smallest amount of lies dormant in her heart. She will be trapped in her body, a mere husk of her former self, wanting to die yet unable to do so. I would not wish such an existence upon anyone. My tears had subsided for something worse, a feeling I could hardly put to words, a feeling of loneliness so immense I could barely breathe. I felt like I was being crushed by infinite grief. The boy smiled sadly. You see how cruel destiny is, John? By all accounts, your actions will be directly to blame for this. 
One moment of rage will destroy everyone you care about the most. What you seek is justice. What you offer is condemnation. A searing anger took a hold of me. Why are you doing this to me? Why are you torturing me like this? The boy shook his head but offered no reply. I wanted to leave. I wanted to run away and never look back. But I couldn't find the strength to get to my feet. Instead, I dropped my head in my hands. I thought I had more time. The boy smirked. Everyone always thinks they have more time. I wish I could have told her how proud I was. The boy placed a gentle hand on my shoulder. She knew. I patted his hand, unable to respond. Together we stood on a little hill in silence. The minutes crept by. Why did you really come to me? The boy scratched the back of his head and looked at me. He seemed to be deliberating with himself. I have always believed myself to be bound by laws I have no control over. Laws I don't quite understand. To my surprise, the boy suddenly chuckled. But lately I met someone so outrageous, they dared to challenge my path. Can you imagine? A speck of dust challenging the full might of the inevitable. The boy fell silent for a moment. Then he continued. She made me wonder whether I too can challenge what which seems inevitable. Maybe the constraints which bind me are self-imposed. Maybe I fear the freedom disobedience would grant me. The boy smirked. I live for those moments. Reminders of how exceptional life can be. She made me realize something, John. If she managed to find the strength to confront me, then maybe someone as lost as myself, bound by eternity, might possess the power to break free. I don't understand. Sometimes when people die, their gaze manages to pierce through time and they get a glimpse of what is to come. Your daughter saw all of this. He pointed at the crowd below. Then the boy smiled. Mara was exceptionally stubborn when I met her. She absolutely refused to come with me. She refused to submit to her fate, as few have done before her. The thought brought a smile to my face. Do you know why she refused to come with me, John? Out of anger? The boy shook his head. Out of love. Her love for you. For her mother. For her sister. Her love was strong enough to challenge forces even I dare not resist. I was in awe of her, John. That's why I promised her to show you this. She truly was a kind child. Silent tears rolled down my face, but their sting was less painful than before. The boy grabbed my hands and gently pulled me back to my feet. In time, you will see her again. She will be waiting for you. For all of you but she hoped she would still be waiting a while longer. Do you understand? I did not have the strength to answer. All I could do was give the boy a weak nod. Together we walked back to the bus and took our familiar seats in the back. Thank you, I said after a moment. Thank you for taking care of Mara. Thank you for helping me. The boy looked taken aback. Wherever I go, people usually fear me. They recoil at my touch, even if I only mean to help. I have always been hated because I am a reminder of the inevitable. Never before has someone thanked me. His words carried such emotion. 
I tentatively put my arm around the child's shoulder. The boy gazed up at me. Tears slowly formed in his eyes. He leaned into me and cried. I let him. Before long, I fell into a deep sleep. When I awoke, we were back at the bus stop. The boy accompanied me to the front where the door slid open. I walked down the little stairs. The moment my feet hit the pavement, the dials on my watch began to move once more. This is where we part, the boy said from inside the bus. I looked at him sheepishly. My mouth opened, but no words came out. I did not know what to say. Where will you go from here? The boy shrugged. I never know. Are you... Death? I suddenly asked. The boy grinned as the door slowly slid closed. I sat at the bus stop long after the bus had disappeared. Then I walked back towards my car. On the bridge, I took the weapon from my pocket and threw it into the river. I was ready to go home. <laughs>